Hi, everyone. We are excited to be here with our 59th session of the Learning Salon. I cannot believe it. It's been this long since August 2020 when we were all in our pajamas. And it seems like we're still in our pajamas <laughs> talking to each other. Uh, a reminder, um, the Learning Salon is a forum where uh, we discuss interdisciplinary perspectives on artificial and biological learning. Uh, bridges and contentions between them. And our audience is interdisciplinary. We have folks from um, neuroscience, computational, uh, various computational disciplines, philosophy, social sciences, uh, psychology. And um, a reminder that if you have any questions during the talk, please put them in the uh, chat if you think others can answer. If it's a question to the speaker, put it in the ask a question area and vote on each other's question. A final reminder that uh, we believe in uh, truth-oriented and understanding-oriented discussions. So disagreement is absolutely okay, but disrespect is not okay. And just be fair in your questions, but there is no wrong question as long as it's respectful. And um, disagreement with reasons, with justification, with references is completely valid as well, as long as it's articulated with reasons and without you know, interrupting or in, uh, dis uh, disrespecting. With that said, we are extremely excited to have Earl Miller uh, finally at the Learning Salon. I, um, uh, uh, Earl has played, a, uh, without his knowledge, he has played a big role in my career because um, the paper that he, uh, he had with John Cohen, I think in 2001, about the structure of the prefrontal cortex played a huge role in how I um, sort of understood the brain. And the reason that I moved actually, one of the reasons I moved into neuroscience and I started using fMRI to decode future intentions from prefrontal cortex in humans was really having read that paper. And later on, I went and worked with John Cohen. Uh, so um, a huge uh, privilege to have him here to discuss with us. And I also have to say the first time that I saw Earl was not him giving a talk, but it was him on stage with Pablo's dogs giving a concert. So that also is very aligned. As you know, I play music. So <laughs> that's uh, another reason why Earl is a perfect role model for uh, scientists interested in prefrontal cortex and music. Well, With that, sure about that but okay. <laughs> <laughs> John is going to say something if his video doesn't keep going on and off. I think John wanted to say something before we start. You're muted. I'm going to unmute you. Okay. Well, why can't I see you guys? I can see myself, but I can't see you guys. We can see you too. Yeah, we're the lucky mm. ones. <laughs> well, I just wanted, if I, I if I may, um, I wanted, and I'm sure Earl um, will appreciate this, to just say a word about Mark Stokes, who yes, um, thank you, was a wonderful scientist who passed away recently after an extraordinarily brave battle with his illness. Um, I only got to meet him a couple of times. I can't say that he was a friend, but I was an admirer. Obviously, he at Oxford, um, he did work on working memory, something dear to Earl's heart, um, and was actually, if I'm saying this right, was trained by John Duncan, another pioneer in thinking about the prefrontal cortex. So I think that he passed away far too young. He was a wonderful person. I think with his blog, Brain Box, he sort of very much lived in the spirit of the learning salon. Um, so I would just like to say that we all appreciated him. He very much lived up to the spirit of what we're trying to do. And I think, Earl, um, you knew him much better, but I, I hope it was okay for me to mention him before you speak. Oh, yes, Mark, great scientist, great guy. Uh, someone who had bold new ideas and followed him up with brilliant experimental work that supported it. And he will be sorely missed. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, with that, Earl, maybe you'd like to share your screen. Sure, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Just one sec. Now the sharing part, because that is caring. There we go. Videos are moving around. There we go. Window on that. There you go. Boom. How's that? We still don't see it. Oh, now we see it. Perfect. Uh, there we go. Cool. Excellent. Right. Are we off and running? Yes, please. Stay okay. Too. Hi, everybody. And thank you, Ida. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, John, for the uh, invitation and for the uh, really kind um, introduction. 
So I'll just dive right in, shall I? Um, I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna talk about today about um, how our view of the brain has changed since I was a graduate student back in in the 1980s, and we really have come a long way, and our views changed a little bit. And that's what I'm going to start with. And I'm going to put, talk about some of my work, but it'll be in the context of how our views of the brain have changed. So back, you know, when I was a graduate student in the 20th century, we used to think about the brain as kind of being like clockwork. It was a collection of specialized parts and each part had one function only. Now we all know what the parts are. The parts are the neurons. These are the gears that make the brain run and they signal one another by giving off electrical impulses. We all know this, hopefully. Um, and this is the kind of work, this is the pioneering work from Hebel and Wiesel back in 1962. Back before this, people had little idea how, how they could actually get something meaningful from the activity of indiv individual neurons. What Hubel and Wiesel did is they recorded from neurons in the visual cortex of an animal, and they found and, and presented various stimuli um, edges and bars and stuff on a computer screen. Well, actually, back then, it was an actual screen in front of the animal. And they found results like this, like this neuron they happen to be recording from. They dropped their microelectrode, as we do now. They dropped their microelectrode down into the brain. And the microelectrode is just one bit of um, uh, uninsulated part of the tip. And you get that tip near a neuron, and you know, it's like activity of one neuron only. And this neuron they happened to isolate on this particular day, activated, gave off these spikes whenever the animal saw an edge of a particular orientation, a bar of light, at a specific location on the retina. So the idea was, and what came, what the idea that came out of this is this, this is what this neuron does. It detects this edge, and this is this neuron's one and only function, edge detection. And of course, your visual cortex breaks down your visual field into a bunch of tiny line segments, all specialized, all with specialized neurons detecting little line segments of different orientations at different places. So other neurons spiked out edges at other orientations and locations, and you put that all together, and somehow you get vision. So these are the parts, the neurons. How did they work together? Well, back in the day, we used to think that neurons like gears work together because they're physically connected. In other words, neurons combine their signals because they're wired together. So this is what I've illustrated here. We have neurons back in our visual cortex that detect small edges, small bars of light. And then um, they because these, these two neurons project to a higher level neuron and this neuron combines those signals, you get neurons that respond to longer edges. And then they combine their signals down to another stage of processing, all by virtue of which neurons are wired together. And they combine their signals, and you get neurons that are, are detector, detectors of uh, corners. And then you combine, combine, combine. There's a lot of neurons in your brain. You keep combining all these signals by virtue of these um, connected neurons. And you get the paper clips and these complex neurons that will respond to complex shapes and stuff like that. Um, and you have a lot of neurons in your brain, so you keep combining, 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 and eventually you get the peace, love, and understanding. That's kind of the way we thought the brain worked. But we now think of the brain as much more complex and dynamic. Now, why do we think that way about the brain? Before, I want to make sure you're clear, I'm, I'm not here to say that the old clockwork paradigm from the 20th century, this paradigm I'm now describing, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's right to a certain level of approximation. And also, it was foundational. Yet, if you're going to figure out something as complex as the brain, first thing you do is figure out the parts, and then you put them together. So this work was foundational to get us to where we are now. But also, we have to recognize that there's limitations in technology limit our scope as scientists. There's a bit of streetlight effect in science. Uh, scientists only study what we can measure. We, if we can measure something, we can study it. If we can't measure it, then what's the point of uh, talking about it? Because we don't have any data on it. Well, back in the, uh, back in the 20th century, state of the art was recording electrical activity from a single neuron and a single electrode. This is due to technology limitations. We, we had computers that aren't as fast and fancy as they are now, so they can only process signals from one channel. And amplifiers back then, kids, were not on microchips, but they were things in a box. So there's a limit. To, we were pretty much limited to recording neurons one at a time from a single electrode. And of course, 
if that's the way you study the brain, that's the way you're going to think about the brain. We thought about the brain like clockwork because we only study it really one piece at a time. But now we study the brain in a, in a more holistic fashion. So what changed? Well, first of all, we understand more. The clockwork paradigm, again, is not wrong. It was a start. And once we figure out the parts, we can say more about how they may connect together. And, of course, there's, we, there's a lot of new technology, multiple electrode recording, optogenetics. Here's a multiple electrode array. Now we can record from hundreds or even thousands of neurons simultaneously um, from different parts of the brain, not just one particular location in the brain. And as a result, there's now been this paradigm shift where we, where we um, now kind of think of the brain as more on a network level. And what we're seeing now is the brain's emergent properties. Emergent properties are properties and mechanisms that only emerge when the parts interact as a wider whole. And I'll give you an example of that in a couple of minutes. But so we used to only focus on spike, the, the spikes, the um, electrical impulses from individual neurons. And that's what you could think of the spikes as being like individual voices. If I passed a microphone around, everybody spoke into the microphone at one time, that would be spikes. They're, they're voices of individual neurons. But now we also talk about things like also back then, but we talk more in these days about things like local field potentials. This is the average activity of millions of neurons near the electrode tip. So think of it as the roar of the local crowd. And you can take this up even farther, and you can see things at the level of electrical fields, which is the roar of a, of a larger crowd, because that's what happens when you work with electrical impulses. They create electrical fields that combine and, and combine and they interact. So our work focuses on the prefrontal cortex and top-down or executive control. Now, the prefrontal cortex we know is critical for planning, monitoring, and, exe and executing complex goal-directed behavior. When I started in the field more years ago than I care to say, the state of the art for the prefrontal cortex was it does a working memory. It's what you use to hold. The prefrontal cortex holds things in mind. When we started working on it, we thought, well, that's important. And certainly the prefrontal cortex does that. But, but if it's involved in goal-directed behavior, the prefrontal cortex needs to know what to do. Some part of your brain needs to know how to get to goals. In other words, the, we thought the major prefrontal cortex function is to learn and use the rules of the game, not just to hold things in working memory, but figure out what needs to be held in working memory and what needs to be done with it. The rules that govern how our society works and identifies goals for us, potential goals, and how we get to those goals. And this is called top-down information, knowledge of the world, how the world works, and it's used to predict possible goals and the means to achieve them. So we did a number of studies to test this. This is starting about 24 years ago now. And we did a number of studies where we looked to see whether the prefrontal cortex really is a part of the brain that absorbs all this top-down information. And we taught animals high-level concepts, like categories like cats versus dogs, shape categories. And they could, they could perform these tasks even with cats they've never seen before, or dogs they've never seen before. And we did the same thing for small numbers. We taught animals the small numbers one through five until they could tell you that a display contained one, two, three, or four or five things. And does it make a difference how, what the display was? And we even went higher. We went to rules and concepts like principles like same versus different and up versus down. And what this told us across all these studies is the prefrontal cortex really does absorb top-down information. Its neurons learn all these principles but throw away all the unnecessary details about like individual cats or the exact display of numbers that are, are important for the task. It's the principle that's, and the, the abstraction that's important for the task. And that's what the prefrontal cortex absorbs. Okay, we also went on to show how this could be used for the control, for top-down control and cortex. And that's the subject of the paper that it, it, I um, mentioned. Now, before I get a little deeper into this, I want to turn to one thing just to make sure we're all on the same page, and that's the idea of paradigm shifts. So Thomas Kuhn pointed out that science does not proceed in a linear and continuous way. We have a shared paradigm. We all labor under it. We, we support it. We, we flaw details. But after a while, that paradigm begins to run its course. It can't explain everything. And people begin, begin to look at new things and that, then there's new phenomenon that people can't really explain in the old paradigm. And there's a bit of drama, which I'll get into. 
But eventually, then there's a, a relatively rapid shift. Not, but a, a rapid. I mean, like 20 years, 10, 20 years. There's a shift to a new way of thinking, and that, then we, that changes how we, the way we think. And that new thinking, a new paradigm, guides our thinking and experimentation. And this is because science is done by people. They're skeptical of new ideas that don't fit the scene, don't seem to fit the way we think. And that's rightly so. I mean, we don't want to accept any new idea that comes along. It has to prove itself, right? But also, people being people, they tend to defend the old familiar paradigm. You know, you, you, you're trained in a certain way, you think in a certain way, so you tend to defend what's familiar, and you're overly skeptical of the things that are new. And so we're not perfect. So science isn't a straight march forward. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a stagger forward, but it does move forward. Now, in conducting the work that I just told you about, we found something that was kind of paradigm shifty. Um, we found we used new back then, back in the day when I was a graduate student, we were recording from one neuron at a time. A, a large study would be 100 neurons, and it might take us 100 days to, to study those neurons. So we're very selective about which neurons we study, and our, our sampling wasn't very good because it was a small number of neurons. But now we can record from hundreds of thousands of neurons, and this new technology back when we started these experiments allowed us to record from hundreds of neurons and do more random sampling of, of the neurons. And what we found, much to our surprise, in the prefrontal cortex, these effects, cat versus dog, numbers, same versus different, they were present in 30 to 40% of the neurons in the prefrontal cortex and other higher cortical areas like the parietal cortex. 30 to 40%. That's a lot of neurons. It's like the task took over the brain. And the problem is, is that the clockwork paradigm predicts the opposite of this. It predicts that should be a, there should be a diverse group of specialized neurons with different functions. And eventually you get to the top of the hierarchy and there's a few neurons that are highly specialized for these high level things. It does not predict large populations of neurons that seem to have the same function. And this being, you know, kind of paradigm shift and a little bit of defense of the old paradigm. And when I first started presenting this work like 25 years ago or so, uh, I got a lot of skepticism. People would say, how can this be true? You know, you teach the animal three things and its brain fills up, or that's because the animal spends so much time learning the task. So it actually is a distortion of what a, what a normal brain should be because so much time spent learning this task took over the animal's brain. That never made sense to me because, you know, we humans carry, I've been doing neuroscience for 30 something years and I uh, me and others have been playing musical instruments for that long. And so this, the kind of experience the animal had in these experiments is pales in comparison to the kind of experience, experience we carry around in our heads. What eventually we found, the solution is, is that cortical neurons don't have one function. They are multifunctional because they have the, this property called mixed selectivity, which I'll explain in, in a moment. But the solution that John Duncan and I first proposed in the, uh, around the year 2000 is that the reason why all these neurons are doing, because these 30 or 40% of the neurons are showing effects, is because they have more than one function. So it's not a big deal. They're like utility players on a baseball team, jack of all trades. They can do different things at different times. So it's not a big deal that all these neurons are devoted to this task, because they can do other things too. And we did a number of studies. Other people started doing the work. And this, this, this these results of large numbers of neurons um, uh, uh, was true across many, many, from many, many different labs. So, so, and then we did also did other studies where we would not teach the animal one task as is often done. We teach the animal three tasks or four tasks, and you could track the same neuron across different tasks doing different functions in different tasks. But it isn't random. Every time you go back to the same task, the neuron does the same thing, just does different things in different contexts. So, what are these multifunctional mixed selectivity neurons? Well, again, back in the 20th century, uh, we thought of that neurons detected single things like edges or a combination of a few things that um, that corresponded to like one percept. So um, a few neurons might combine color and form and motion to percept a rolling ball. But in conducting these studies, we found these mixed selectivity neurons that they were selective for complex combinations with no obvious relationship. If you train the animal in different tasks and study these neurons at different times, these neurons will seem to do different things, different functions in different contexts. And they seem to have no obvious relationship to one another. And they were multifunctional. 
So why are these mixed selective neurons, mixed selectivity neurons so important for this top-down, high-level information the animal is learning? My colleagues Stefano Fusi, Mattia Regatta, and Melissa Warden, they showed they did computational using data from Melissa, Stefano and Mattia did computational modeling that showed why these mixed selectivity neurons are so important. They add horsepower to the brain. They create a high dimensional representational space where more complex representations can be represented and that allows more complex computation. And it increases the storage capacity of the brain by distributing information across many neurons. If you build these toy models and every neuron does one function, the models quickly satur saturate and they can't learn more than a few tasks. We start adding in these mixed selectivity neurons and you get to this number of about 30 to 40% and the model goes capacity unlimited. And it'll, they allow, big selectivity allows faster learning and flexibility. Because all this information is intermingling, it's a wide variety of information is intermingling in the same population of neurons, things can be put together really quickly because the brain has the inf all the information on the fingertips. And for the same reason, you can get flexible behavior because representations can be formed and recombined and recombined on the fly. No, but this idea, and at first, again, this idea of mixed selectivity was met with a little bit of skepticism. We were accused of um, turning the cortex into a bowl of porridge um, and stuff like that. But, you know, eventually, there's now, there, now mixed selectivity is pretty much commonly accepted. I'm seeing new papers all the time about mixed selectivity here, here and there. Good thing. But this led to a problem with the old paradigm. According to the clockwork paradigm, anatomy is destiny. Neurons combine signals because they are wired together. So the idea was that every perception, every thought, every action, everything your brain does has a unique anatomical network called an ensemble. I've illustrated this here. Here's this network for thought blue, we'll call it. Another network for thought red. Separate networks, separate ensembles, separate bits of information, separate percepts, separate memories. But Mixed selectivity means that neurons aren't members of one network, they're members of multiple networks. So not this, but more like this. Now I've combined our red and blue network into a single a network that it has anatomically overlapping parts. So we have our red neurons and our blue neurons, but they're connected. They share these multifunctional neurons that do both. They're part of both networks. Okay, so that this is what mixed selectivity leads us to conclude. But if anatomy is destiny, how does this work? If neurons work by combining their signals, why don't all the networks activate one another and create a jumble of thoughts? I try to activate the red network here, and the red neurons activate, but then the activity runs to the mixed selectivity neurons, and then to the blue network, and now you have both networks activated, both ensembles, and your thoughts are a mush. So how does your brain deal with this? Well, one solution that many of us have come to, the solution is brain waves. Your brain oscillates. Your brain is a highly oscill oscillating machine. It's the most obvious signal you can, re you can record from the brain. It oscillates anywhere from one time a second to four times a second, 13, 30, up to 100 times a second or more. And what brain waves are, they're an emergent property. They're the synchronized activity of millions of neurons a large scale organization of neural activity. So here's a crowd doing the wave. You can see the wave moving from left to right. Organization of large numbers of elements. But in the past, when we had this piecemeal view of the brain, brain waves were often dismissed as being like the humming of a car engine. Humming doesn't make the engine run, it just reflects the engine running. But I submit to you that that, that is a that that attitude was a our, was a um, byproduct of our thinking about the brain in pieces. Because if you think about it, if a stadium crowd, such as you see here, can self-organize using a few simple rules, like stand up and the person on my left stands up, imagine what your brain can do with that principle. So for executive control, large you need this kind of large-scale organization for top-down executive control. You have to control whole sections of the brain so they're all on the same page together, coordinated and directed towards the task at hand. 
how are you going to do that on, on an individual neuron level? You're going to have a, a gazillion gate control gates on a gazillion synapses. You can't. That's possibly complex. But if you control things on this on this scale by these brain waves, where you control sections of uh, coordinated sections of neurons, now you're at a scale that's useful for executive control. And also, there's something called representational drift. Neurons are fickle; they come and go. If you record from 100 neurons or a million neurons and do 100 identical trials or a million identical trials, do the same thing over and over again, you will get 100 or a million different patterns of neural, neural activity. The brain is kind of like the world's largest orchestra. The song plays on, but indiv individual players are constantly coming and going. They're arriving, they're playing, and then they're leaving. That's how neurons work in your brain. They're, they're, there's a the large amount of representational drift. But at this higher level, in this case, here's a study from Dimitris Pinosis, where if you look at the level of like, now we're looking at the level of the electrical fields, the neuroelectrical fields that the neural activity in the brain creates. And he found that you could read the contents of working memory from electrical fields near, near the brain. But here's, here's the trick, or here's the good part. There's little or no representational drift. It is a solid representational information channel. Now I submit to you, doesn't that sound like a useful level for organizing brain activity? If you want to get engaged in top-down control, pay attention, so select certain things for, for processing, thinking about, engage in certain actions, connect things together. you got to do things at this level of organization where you're connecting millions of neurons together in, in an in a organized, coherent way. I don't, I don't see how you could do it by organizing things on the level of individual neurons. And isn't it easier, when you get to this higher level, there's less and less representational drift, isn't it easier to control a stable representation? I mean, if you want to conduct the orchestra, individual players are coming and going. There's no use to, to instructing individual players. You're instructing the, uh, the sections of the orchestra, right? And that's the whole thing about, about this higher level is that individual neurons come and go. The players of the orchestra are, are, are going and leaving, leaving and coming back. But the song plays on. The function is the, is the song. So somehow the, the, there's a higher level of organization that, that has a stable representation that all these fickle players are contributing to. So the way to think about it, we think, is networks formed by synchronizing their oscillatory activity, their brain waves. Think of them as two overlapping networks of neurons shown here on the left that are doing separate waves, separate crowd waves. The idea is that neurons that hum together temporarily wired together. And what this endows the brain is cognitive flexibility. It takes a long time to make new connections in your brain or change connections. But, but with this kind of format where neurons that hum together, wire together, network, network can be formed, changed, all without actually rewiring your brain, but just by changing the resonance patterns of the brain waves. So you have resonance patterns stay stable until you flip them to a new format, then they flip to a new format and they're stable there. So you have the you have the um, combined stability when you need it and flexibility when you need it. That's what these patterns of brainwave resonance bias. So the way to think about it is brain anatomy is not destiny, it's possibility. Brain anatomy is like the road and highway system. It just says where traffic could go. Your thoughts are where traffic actually does go moment to moment on the streets and roads that make up this, this um, infrastructure. So we think the brain with these, these, these brainwave patterns direct the traffic. They determine where traffic goes from moment to moment. Okay. How am I doing on time? You have as much as you want. Oh, I'll, I'll, I won't be much longer. So is there evidence for this? Yes, a lot. Here's just one example. Tim Bushman was in the lab. He trained animals to switch back and forth between two behavioral rules. They were looking at a, um, take that distraction out of the way for a moment. They were looking at an, either a vertical or horizontal bar, and the bar was red or it was blue. And you cue the animal, either pay attention to color or pay attention to orientation. You do that randomly from trial to trial. So the monkey's switching back and forth between two rules. And what this shows is neural activity in the lateral prefrontal cortex. This would be right here on the side of my head, about right here, above, above the animal's forehead, uh, sorry, behind the animal's forehead, a little bit above its eye. That's posterior, that's anterior. This is the principal sulcus that runs on the center of the lateral prefrontal cortex. 
And each of these circles is a different recording site where we have one of our microelectrodes. The colored lines show which pairs of recording sites showed an increase in their LFP synchrony, their brainwave synchrony, if you will, um, when the animal was following the color rule versus the orientation rule. So you get different patterns of brainwave synchrony for one rule versus the other. They're overlapping, as you'd expect from a system with a lot of mixed selectivity, but you get unique patterns, unique ensembles, if you will, from these, these uh, synchronized patterns of, um, of LFP activity. And we looked across all um, frequencies and we found that these effects were mainly in the, in the beta band, whose relevance I'll explain in just a moment. Which and that moment is now. So uh, we also found we were finding that different brainwave frequencies carry different types of information, kind of like different FM radio stations. So don't make the mistake. All these frequency bands, like uh, theta being four to eight times a second, then then alpha, then beta, uh, on up. These were labels and designations someone made 150 years ago in a very arbitrary way. So there's not. Beta is not just beta. There's, there's the actual biology, you know, leaks leaks across these boundaries, and it's good. I think the function is going to be more like differences in frequencies rather than absolute frequencies. So don't get caught up in the labels too much. But what we found is that high frequencies, frequencies in the gamma range, they're the signals that feed. They're the brain waves that feed forward sensory signals from your sensory system in the back of the brain forward in your brain to your executive prefrontal cortex. So all this spiking that's carrying the uh, information about what you're seeing, what you're hearing, et cetera, is all riding on, the, on these gamma waves. And then we found that the feedback signals that go from the executive prefrontal cortex back and modulate the rest of the cortex, they're carried by low frequency, frequency waves. They carry the top-down executive signals that regulate cortical processing. And this makes sense because it's easier to control large populations of neurons if you're doing it with, with lower frequencies and, high, and higher frequencies. And in fact, we believe that the imbalance between the, the uh, sense information is flooding into your, uh, your brain and your brain's got to regulate it because too much it can't process everything. So too much sensory information is bad. And that's what we think these low frequency um, oscillations are doing. And we think the imbalance between low and high could explain things like ADHD or even the sensory overload seen in autism. It's, we think it's because the, the, the low frequencies are too weak and, the, and then the high frequency sensory signals overwhelm the brain. So we're working on interventions to rebalance them. So um, these brain waves can act not just in a general way, organizing uh, large scale populations of neurons, they can also act in very precise ways too. So we found in prefrontal cortex, as others have found in places like sensory cortex, something called traveling waves. These waves that I'm talking about don't just go up and down like a jump rope. They're not standing waves. They move and travel around cortex. And that's a good thing because if they, if they were standing waves, that means whole networks would go active and then go silent, active and silent. You don't want to disrupt the processing of whole networks of neurons. We said these waves travel through networks, only acting on small bits of the network at a time, preserving network integrity and having functions. So here's an example from the lateral prefrontal cortex of an animal, animal performing a working memory task. And as you can see, uh, it's a, this is real time, so it's not, you know, it's not a, um, it's a bit of a noisy signal, but you can see this is millivolts here. You can see the, um, relative to a reference, you can see that this wave doesn't just stay in one place, it's rotating around the uh, lateral prefrontal cortex. And that's exactly what we found. We found that these waves move in very precise ways. They're not like ping pong balls bouncing around the cortex randomly. They follow very specific anatomical axes. And in this particular experiment, in this particular animal, we found that there was, a, there was rotation along this anterior um, posterior dorsal ventral axis. And the rotations went in two directions. They went out one way and back the other way, back and forth like that. And that was when the animal was at rest. When the animal started to perform a task, depending on the task, the, uh, the, uh, on the cognitive demands, the brainwave changed their direction of rotation. So they changed, the, they changed their travel of cognitive demands. Now, traveling waves are interesting because they're super helpful. 
They can buffer information about elapsed time and recent network activity. And those things are super important for, for neural computation. You can't do neural computation without this kind of information. So the way to think about it is that if I take a video of a pond and I drop in four pebbles one at a time, I can show you a still photograph of that pond and you could tell me how many pebbles have dropped, where they dropped, and how long ago they dropped. So that's what wave, traveling waves buy you, the ability to buffer information about time and recent network activity. So I could go on and tell you our work about, um, and last thing I'll just briefly mention, we're also studying how general anesthesia causes loss of consciousness. There's been this tacit assumption that it kind of just turns off your cortex. Well, it doesn't. What it does is it drastically alters brainwave patterns. So here's a bunch of recordings of LFPs and spikes from four brain areas of an animal. Again, the LFPs are being the roar of the local crowd, the spikes of individual voices. And what you see, in, this is real time here, and what you see in the awake state is how the high frequency FM radio chatter as networks form and unform and do, and there's interactions between, different, between frequency bands, you know, bit lower frequencies, higher frequencies, and they're all interacting and forming networks and breaking apart, a lot of chatter going on. Then we anesthetize the animal with a propofol, commonly used anesthetic, and all this high frequency chatter we associate with cognition and we think consciousness is replaced by this low frequency one hertz hum. So anesthesia doesn't just turn off your cortex, it shifts it to a frequency mode that's incompatible with cognition and consciousness. And we, we, we to further test this hypothesis, we found we're able to restore consciousness in animals by high frequency electrical brain simulation that restore this high frequency chatter to the cortex. We're using these studies to develop safer methods of delivering anesthesia. So, conclusion, there's been a paradigm shift in our understanding of the brain. Your brain is not clockwork. Neural activity underlying cognition is complex, dynamic, and rhythmic. And emergent properties like brain waves organize brain activity. And they play key roles in cog cognition and consciousness, we believe. Now, I want to clear up, I've talked about this stuff before, so I want to clear up a couple of misconceptions that often, sometimes, not often, sometimes comes up. And that is, spikes are important. I'm not saying, we're not saying that spikes aren't important. You need spikes to get the waves, and the waves do something. So we love spikes. We study spikes. We study spikes along with LFPs and electrical fields. We're not saying that, that this higher level does everything. And one little ground rule, we can discuss this if you like, but I, I my girl, no epiphenomena. No one knows these, like, but like the humming of a car engine, these waves and dynamics are often dismissed as being epiphenomenal. They reflect the brain doing something, but they don't actually do something themselves. Well, no one, no one knows enough about how the brain works to call a signal an epiphenomenon. Uh, when I hear, oh, that's an epiphenomenon, what I hear is that doesn't fit my model. And finally, there are no spikes versus LFPs. People thought, well, people often say well, there's spikes and LFPs. How can you show each of this? They're, they're together, they're part of the spikes spikes and local other lo and, and create electrical fields that contribute to the so it's all one one big manifestation of the same thing there's but a large proportion of what we're measuring when we measure lfps and spikes are the spiking combined activity of, of um spiking activity and the electrical fields created by these electrical fluctuations they're inextricably linked together so, so, um, and I think the way we need to study the brain is by studying them all, especially and including, I should say including, everybody has their own, own uh, um, level they want to work at, but including this higher emergent level. So I, I believe that's where cognition and consciousness truly lies. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, should I unshare or what, what, what should I do? Sure. If you unshare, then we can start the rounds of questions first. Those of us who are the hosts usually ask questions and then gradually everyone else. And to everyone in the audience, uh, please remember to add your questions in the ask a question area. I see we already have five, but please add more and vote on each other's questions so that we start by highest voted questions. And also, um, if you don't want to appear on screen, just say ask for me. Otherwise, if there is time, we might ask if you're around to ask the question yourself. 
Okay, so this was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And there are obviously a lot of questions, a lot of things to discuss. I want to give the chance to um, for Melanie maybe to start first if uh, she would like to. Okay, thanks, Ida. This was really fascinating. Um, and I have so many questions, but I won't have time to ask them. But my first question is probably one that you've gotten before. You said you can read the contents of working memory from electric fields near the brain. Mm -hmm. So how far does that go? I mean, you know, I assume this is simple, relatively simple experiments in, in monkeys, but is this going to lead to, you know, mind reading technologies and so on? Uh, no, probably not. When you get outside the skull, for example, there's a lot of um, filtering of high frequencies. So you're losing a lot of resolution detail. You're losing a lot of spatial resolution. When we say electrical fields, I'm not talking about something you could read one foot from the skull. I'm talking about the near electric fields that are hovering right around the um, neurons and, and the and the connections. So really like near electric fields, just feel like a little step up from, from LFPs. Okay. Um, another kind of more de detailed question is, um, you showed a picture of the brain with the prefrontal cortex kind of in a purplish color with arrows going back from the free, prefrontal yeah. cortex to uh, the rest of the brain. So um, that it, the question is, you know, this, this is top-down guidance, but do, I assume arrows go in the other direction too, yep, that do. sensory um, information and memory and all of that emotion are, are going up. And oh, yeah, so yeah. is there a, is there a sense of like how influenceable is the prefrontal cortex from the rest of the stuff that's going on? Or is there just some fixed kind of program pushing things in a certain way? Well, so the prefrontal cortex, you're absolutely right. The, the, the slide I used from, uh, was from um, Berridge and Arnston. These dual figures meant just to illustrate the top-down um, influence, but it goes both ways. So the prefrontal cortex is one of the great integrators of your brain. It receives inputs from virtually your entire cortex, except for primary sensory and primary motor cortex. And it's interconnected with all these subcortical structures, like the hippocampus and subcortical structures involved in internal state, rewards, stuff like that. So the prefrontal cortex, much like the hippocampus or basal ganglia, is a place where a lot of information com comes together in the brain. But at the same time, the prefrontal cortex sends projections back to all the things it gets, it gets information from, so it could play this role as a, as a top-down puppet master. I mean, how much of an influence it has, that depends on mom moment to moment. It's going to be different modes that... Like I think about um, uh, Leslie Kay's work where um, uh, not, not, not about prefrontal cortex per se, but these shift in modes of what the brain does. So, you, you know, rats sniffs a few odors and there'll be like three sniffs, let's say. So there'll be three bursts of gamma and then suddenly a shift to, to beta, like really suddenly. Leslie has a beautiful ta tattoo on this, by the way. Um, and uh, it's really, 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 it's a classic finding in the, in the olfactory volume. What's going on in, the, in those initial bursts is the, is the, first of all, gamma was organizing all the spiking, and the spiking is being driven by this odors and the sniffing. Then the moment the, the sniffing stops, the brain shifts to these lower frequency beta oscillations. And now that spiking in gamma to the um, odor is a very local phenomenon. It just gets fed, fo fed forward into, into the brain. But when we switch this this lower frequency mode, now it all of a sudden connects together the entire olfactory system and the motor system, and it's linked to the decision the animal animal makes. So that's kind of what the prefrontal cortex is going to be kind of like that. It's going to be dominated by sensory information when it's flooding in in there, and then when the information isn't so strong, you know, they can do other things with it. Like if I um, you could be doing um, mental calculation in your head. But if I drive a truck at you, that's going to overwhelm your uh, what you're doing and, and you're going to jump out of the way, right? <laughs> I would hope so, unless I'm I looking so at my phone. <laughs> um, so so another, another question, I have like two more questions. Um, you showed a slide where um, the, 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 the organism's looking at a, like a red vertical bar. Mm -hmm. And there's one kind of network for representing red and another network for representing vertical. The main the, yeah. the, uh, atom, the, the networks that represent red and vertical, they represent pay attention to color or pay attention to orientation. But what's interesting is then you, you look at the neurons that are actually responding to red or blue or horizontal and vertical. And the color neurons synchronize to the color, the color sensory neurons synchronize to the color rule network and the orientation 
sensory neurons signifying whether it's vertical horizontal synchronized to the orientation rule network pretty cool yeah so that's that's really interesting now there i know there's some like a lot of work in psychophysics on this sort of feature integration question like how mm -hmm. do we sort of see this as a holistic thing rather than just a collection of free floating features and it has to do with attention is, you know, serial attention being paid. Is that, is, does your story sort of explain that? Uh, yeah, I want to call it my story. I mean, this started with like people like Wolf Singer and Andreas right. Engel and Pascal Fries and so that, and like initial thought was that feature binding, like how do you know that your yellow tennis ball is both yellow and, and round? But that turned, that was a good first approximation, but it's not really, first of all, there's not this feature binding problem in, in the brain so much because all things like color and shape and locate, they're all in, multiplex in the same population neurons. So there's not really any um, separate pure color representation versus pure shape rep representation. But the way to think about it is not feature binding, but network binding. It's binding together networks that need to talk to one another to do a certain thing and form a certain thought or memory at, at a certain time. So not feature binding, but network binding. So how does attention do that? How does attention do that? Yeah. How, I mean, how does that binding happen? So that I'm seeing, you know, I, I can yeah. sort of integrate everything onto one object, for example. Right. Well, so you think of the um, bias competition model of attention from Desmond and Duncan and also our Miller and Cohn model. The idea was that the spiking activity is going back to the, uh, let's, take, let's take selective attention. Spiking activity is sending top-down signals that, that make the representation of a certain location in space or a certain feature, they give it extra energy in a winner-take-all network, and, and that's it. Then you, that's how you pay attention. Well, now think about it not in terms of just how do the spikes know where to go? Spikes know where to go by these synchronized patterns of os oscillatory brainwaves. So this is not anything that's it's the, how it's controlled is is um th this brain this brainwave model is more about the infrastructure by which top-down control can act. How the brain figures out well, this is important or that's important to do this, that that's a whole, whole other topic, but it's, but that's going to be some representation on, in the prefrontal cortex, so high level representation that is expressed in, in ways that it can be used to drive top down feedback and produce that goal directed behavior. That's what the Miller and Cold model is about. The, the prefrontal cortex learns the logic of a goal directed task, but isn't represented in terms of some esoteric logic It's represented in terms of a map of which neural pathways in the rest of the cortex are needed to do this thing, this goal directed behavior. And that and, and the prefrontal cortex sends this map back to the and says, do this like a traffic cop. So think of these oscillations as a way for the these signals to get to where they're going. OK, thanks. Um, just one more question. So so I work in AI and, you know, today's AI is kind of still stuck in the Hubel and Weasel model mm -hmm. of the brain. You know, this is how our neural networks work. They're wholly feed forward. They're not dynamic. Um, this they they um, can't do like the same versus different task in general, and they don't have ways of abstracting in the way that you were talking about. Yeah. So what what do you think is like the key insight that if, if you were hired by DeepMind or another company that you would like want to give to people who work in neural networks to make well, it to make are able to do this. Yeah, people who work in AI know networks. I mean, one of the things that they're trying to do uh, is to figure out, you know, make AI by figuring out how the brain does it using principles inspired by the brain. Well, if you actually record from the brain, the brain is not just doing spiking and it, like in, in spiking network models, there's all these oscillatory dynamics and patterns of coherence. That if you want to figure out how the brain's creating intelligence, you got to take into account all these dynamics. I'm not a network modeler. I'm not an AI, so I can't tell you what to do. I'm just saying that if you want to model your, your networks after the brain, this is the most obvious thing the brain does. You, you, you can, we could record it outside the skull 150 years ago. So I guess that. just, yeah, <laughs> just to follow up, you know, that I guess the, 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 the clockwork version of the brain that you uh, mentioned earlier do you, uh, versus this more dynamic um, uh, wave driven uh, system does is is one of them sort of inherently lacking 
in, in being able to explain the certain kind of phenomenon? I mean, could, could we get there just if we still focused on specialized neurons and so on? Oh, the answer is emphatically no. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, um, we know already you can't explain everything by just spike, spiking alone. So let me go back to the example of the olfactory bulb, right? So the rat's sniffing and there's these gamma oscillations. And what happens is the, the spiking is highly organized during these gamma oscillations. And they have a stronger effect on downstream neurons when they're highly organized, right? And you can look on trials in which the animal is performing well versus performing poorly. And the gamma oscillations in the, is stronger and the spiking more synchronized when the animal performs well. And the gamma gets lower, it gets disorganized, and the spikes get disorganized when the animal is performing poorly. Then you have the state change from sensory um, processing right to the decision um, phase. And then you get the state change from beta to gamma. So all that stuff I just described, you would never see recording from individual neurons. You cannot see it level the neurons. So you're not taking into account this stuff. You are missing a lot of currency of what the brain is doing. Great. Thanks so much. This is really fascinating. Thank you. Oh, my mic wasn't uh, turning itself on. I got scared for a second. Thank you so much, Melanie. I just wanted to say um, there's also oscillatory neural networks that are used in neuromorphic computing, but unfortunately, they're not very popular. And neuromorphic com computing hasn't taken off uh, as much as, let's say, GPUs and, let's say, transformers. It would be very interesting if instead of scaling transformers, we try to actually incorporate oscillations into them and expand them into, to be honest, even Earl's 2000 models of the prefrontal cortex, we still don't have those in AI, which is something that I hope I can manage one day to do. I'm I'm a big proponent of a uh, data sharing. So if any of you network modelers want to like look at actual ground truths from your your work and real actual data, contact me. I'm happy to to share data. Awesome, uh, everyone, you heard it here. Contact you heard it here. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, one thing it, people in neural networks it, they've played with um, feedback. You know that that's the hard part is the dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very hard to train a neural network with feedback. And in fact, this is one of the motivations for transformers. You don't even have to do Recur recursion or, or you know uh, recurrent neural networks you can just do it all with feed forward but ah, that may but be there are there are there is feedback and recurrency in the brain it's clearly a lot of it a lot of it <laughs> right that's exactly right um john would you like to go next before i i ask a couple questions and we move on to the nine questions that are posted and probably more to come you uh, muted, you're muted Wait, I unmuted you. Do you, can you? Now I can. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'll, um, I have a lot of questions too, like Melanie said. I'm going to just try and be as global as possible. Um, okay. I think it's very important to distinguish between neuroscience of the brain changing completely versus needing to think differently when one starts to get into particular areas of cortex. Okay. I don't think that when it comes to the stretch reflex or saccadic eye movements, one could probably, as Lars Optikin once said to me at the NIH, in the brainstem, the neurons are smart and the circuits are dumb, and then you get into cortex and the neurons are dumb and the circuits are smart, yeah, right? So in other like words, that. so it was more, it seems to me, that the regime and the way that one thinks about neurons when it comes to certain computations changed when one got into regions like the prefrontal cortex. Uh, right? well, so it's well, people have been in the prefrontal cortex long before I, I came along. And also, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying oscillations are everywhere, but they don't have to be everywhere to be, be somewhere. And I would also argue that, yeah, I would agree that, that in a subcortical, simple subcortical circuits, which is brainstem circuits, those are not going to be, they're going to be like, you know, specialized neurons, specialized circuits. I would argue the cortex, you know, the cortex is, has it's like our architecture for producing oscillations. So one could argue the cortex evolved to produce all these emergent properties so we could really think on a high level. Yeah, right, right. I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying that I think that what, I think the more specific point is that the regime of interaction for neurons, for cognition, 
is a different regime than what your neurons are doing in simple circuits in the brainstem. In other words, you've basically come up with a different way to use neurons. So, for oh, example, yeah, you talked about... Yeah, that's yeah, certainly and true. That's, yeah. And that's very, very interesting. And so, you know, when you talk about multifunctional mixed cell activity, so this is where I just want to get the logical stream right. So on the one, one hand, you make this very nice, you know, based on the work that Stefano and others have done on mixed cell activity, and the advantage of that, you know, you save real estate, um, you can do multi-representational spaces, et cetera. Um, then you talk about having to bring aggregates of neurons, networks, under some kind of control. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that when you talk about your oscillations and the way to sort of bring an aggregate under some sort of control, and the notion of mixed selectivity, they're not exactly the same thing. They're quite different principles, right? In other words, you could make your arguments for the, the role of oscillations without having to talk about mixed selectivity. Yeah, you're right. right? I, I could, but, but so, I, don't, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's the case, though. No, 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 no. But I'm just saying as, as logical principles, yeah. you can make the case for mixed selectivity. That's great. Then you can make the case for some way to bring aggregates under some kind of control. Oh. And then it gets very much into the notion of what the prefrontal cortex is. You switch from task A to task B. You manage to hold information when you go along a sequence. So in other words, you're beginning, it seems to me, to come up with the mechanics of how to control aggregates of neurons in prefrontal cortex and their representations, which I think is really interesting, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. We had David Bader on a while ago, and he was doing a lot more at the level of the behavior, you know, the ways that, that you can stay on task, the way that you can switch between tasks and, and things like that. Um, and then you talked about rules and, you know, Melanie alluded to this, you know, hey, look, that you can teach the monkeys to learn this rule. You can teach the monkeys to learn that rule. They can switch between the rules. You begin to talk about how that is. But what I find interesting, and I mentioned this to David as well, is we never get a theory of how the content gets represented, right? In other words, there's this PFIT model, right? The, prefer the parietal frontal integration model of intelligence, right? And John Duncan wrote a whole little book on prefrontal cortex, where he talked about G for a third of the book. Mm -hmm. and he but we never hear about that anymore when people talk about prefrontal cortex. We get the hydraulics, we get the mechanics, we get the manipulation of content, but we never get a theory of content. Well, I'm glad Why you asked that? that. I'm glad you asked that, because we have a new paper coming out called, um, it's, <clears throat> it's the word spatial computing in there. I think it's control work by, by the principles of spatial computing about to come out in uh, Nature Communications. And this is exactly what this model shows. So the idea here, if you, if you give me a, it takes a bit of explaining is that the idea is that content, sensory information, the content that which, which your brain works on, information content, that's in the detailed connections of, of neurons forming these uh, ensembles. And like that. Most of what I talked about, about this, these flexible ensembles, it's in more in the control regime, the top-down control segment. Right. It, it, it just so I understand. So in other words, it seems to me that what we've heard a lot about is given you need ensembles, given that the neurons are dumb, but the circuits are smart at the level yeah. of ensembles, that you have to manipulate these ensembles. But that presupposes, does it not, that, that there is content of interest in those ensembles, right? right? And the question is, is what's the theory of the content? Well, I was about to tell you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what. But that's that is. Would you agree that that's the question here, right? Sure. Yeah, it's a good, it's an excellent yeah. question. Absolutely, totally. Yeah. So, the idea is that the information contents. Let's, let's stick with sensory information. The moment it's all in the high dimensional, high frequency, de high frequencies in terms of the connection, the detailed connectivity of how neurons are connected together. Your your cortex is all, has been tuned up by statistical you know, things out there in the world and it has these primitives it could use to represent shapes and corners and stuff like that. That's all very um, fine grain and high dimensional. So think about it as there's all these ensembles in this big sandbox of your brain, okay? And the information it's representing, let's say it's an apple, that isn't just one place. It's the apple, these ensembles are sprinkled all over. There's a lot of redundancy of, the, of this information content in these detailed connections to neurons. Mm 
And what these top down, these low frequency top down signals are doing is they're providing a larger scale pattern of activity that organizes which parts of your cortex are going to respond to Apple. Okay. And so, so think of now as these top down signals providing there's a sandbox, all the different stimuli represented by grains of sand, the ensembles, each ensemble being a grain of sand. And now this top down signal is imposing like a patchwork, a larger patchwork or checkerboard on, on, this, on the sandbox. And what, what and what the checkerboard is, is there's area, areas of low activity where there's where the where it suppresses gamma and spiking, and then patches of high activity where gamma and spiking is allowed to be expressed. And that's the way your brain does computation. By changing these patterns of top-down signals, it controls where the content is allowed, where these ensembles, where the content is, is expressed in neural networks. And if I can just give one more quick example of how, how this works, imagine a simple task where you train the animal, remember, the, I'm gonna show you two pictures, remember both of them and their order. So you show the animal apple and house, and after a delay, it has to pick, oh, apple, house, right? Simple. So the way spatial computing works is that the brain knows the task already, it's been, it knows what to do. So the first stimulus comes along, and in, in anticipation of that, these top-down signals create a certain patchwork um, in your cortex of, of high activity and low activity. And then when the apple actually appears, all the neurons in the patchwork, patchworks of high activity, they respond, apple, 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 and that primes them. Now the second stimulus comes along and the pattern of activity changes and, and this top-down pattern of activity corresponds to first slot or second slot. So we already had the first slot. Now this top, the, the second stimulus is coming along and the brain shifts to a new top-down pattern. And now a new patch of a cortex is now allowed to respond. So the house comes along and the neurons in those active patches go house, 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 and they get primed. Now you want to then recall which stimulus was first and which stimulus was second. You recreate the one pattern or the other and the neurons that were primed will go apple or house. So by controlling where information is, is, is expressing networks, you can actually do computation in networks. Okay, that, that, that's, the, that's the idea. I still feel, I mean, I, I think there are a number of really fascinating ironies here. I mean, absolutely, the spatial computing begins to sound like localization and, and specialization. Um, uh, no, 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 because, because remember, those apples are all over the place. That's the lack of, that's redundancy. That's, a lot, that's the opposite of specialization. So where does the spatial come in? The spatial comes in controlling which sections of the brain's networks are allowed, allowed to express information. But that does sound a little bit like that section of the brain is doing a particular thing versus another section of the brain is doing a particular thing, right? Or, or would you say that at the next time around, the areas which were originally Apple could be switched out and be house? Yeah, because all this, all this, sorry, I should have made this clear. The apples and the houses are all mixed together in all the sand here. Not, there's not an apple square or house square. They're all mixed together because all these ensembles are constantly form, can form and unform by these mixed selectivity neurons. So what you're doing, you're, that's represented. So imagine in each square, each one of these patches, all the stimuli you, you see are, are going to be represented one way or another. And what you're doing is you're controlling which networks are allowed to express that information. So it's the, it's the opposite of specialization in terms of content because all this content is mixed in there and redundant in different places, but you control where the content's allowed to be expressed and that's how you do computation. So, so absolutely. In other words, you know, Ernst Mayer, the evolutionary biologist at some point, and I'm sure I'm butchering what he exactly said, but he at one point said that humans were specialized to be non-specialized, right? Mm -hmm. They could enter into any niche, they could go anywhere. Now, it seems to me that what you're talking about here is that the prefrontal cortex, like humans in his statement, is specialized to be non-specialized. Hence the, hence the kind of criticism that you first came under with your classic cats and dogs experiments yeah. and, and, and all that. Now, and then it seems to me that in the last, you know, 20 years, you've begun to explain the, again, the sort of mechanistic, the mechanics, the actual requirements in order to be able to be specialized, to be non-specialized yeah. in the prefrontal cortex. Right. So in other words, it is a specialization. It's specialization is to be non-specialized, right? In other words, it's got a, it, it, it's got a substrate. Oh, John, it depends on what the definition of is is. <laughs> but, no, no. But what I'm saying is, is that the prefrontal cortex, if it is the seat of intelligence, like in the parietal, you know, the PFIT model or how yeah. John Duncan talked about yeah. things, 
that it seems as though there is something special about the prefrontal cortex. I mean, obviously, that must be you believe that you work in it. Yeah. Um, but it well, seems to me that it's still I still haven't been told why prefrontal cortex can entertain the concept of justice or the concept of mixed selectivity. In other words, I've heard about apples and oranges, but I can see those in the ventral stream. So where is the theory of actual conceptual abstract intelligence here? Well, well John, I apologize that we haven't figured out the whole brain yet. You know, so no, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> criticizing. I'm just saying I'd like to know how right. we get from, from the control principles. So, so let, let me say something first about the specialization yeah. versus generalization, which you very nicely, uh, that, that was uh, very, very nicely said. Yes. And uh, so the thing is, you can imagine two, a continuum of possibilities for what the cortex is like. You can imagine, like, you go back to Lashley, equipotentiality. Your cortex is like a hologram. Every part does everything. Then they have their extreme where it's highly, highly specialized. Well, the truth is going to be somewhere in the middle, okay? That, that's, a, that's what's coming increasingly obvious. But as far as, like, generalization and specialization, that's exactly what the model of uh, um, spatial computing is meant to address because with curl, current network models, the information about how to perform the task is embedded at the same level in the connections to neurons as the content that that the uh, that the uh, rules are working on. It's all it's all in the same level, same format. So with curl network models, you could train a network model to do a working memory task with three objects, and then you switch to, want to switch to three new objects, and you got to retrain the network. Well, humans don't do that. I do it. Learn a task with three. I can do it anything I want now. And that's what spatial computing does by separating the control and the content on different levels of representation, the fine level of individual neurons and the control at the level of these waves. By separating them, it allows them to be manipulated independently. So you can plug in new stimuli to the same rules or change the rules and operate on the same stimuli. It allows the, the um, spatial computing allows the brain to do instant generalization, zero shot learning. So just to so just to, to finish, then I'm beginning to see. So in other words, this spatial computing, which I'm very interested to look at, you have in fact exactly what you just said, sort of separated out the sort of finer granularity for the actual um, stipulation of content, and then this you know, and then you talk about this sort of wave control of control over that content. Yes, exactly right. right. So you're basically you've basically separated out, you know. A lot of the work that's done on prefrontal cortex, which is about the control of content and bringing it in and offline and switching between it and, as you say, generalizing rules. Um, um, and But would you agree, just to sort of press you on this, that when it comes to the kind of content that we believe leads to general intelligence, which is what Melanie's interested in, mm -hmm. and, you know, of course, as you know, Joshua, Joshua Bengio has spoken about needing a prefrontal cortex to have system two, very much arguing for a kind of G. Um, do we have, you know, given John Duncan's interest in this and a mm -hmm. recent tip review that I think he had actually about semantics, um, is the theory of the semantic content, other than saying it's in the connectivity, going to go beyond that? And be as sort of satisfying as how you fleshed out the control part. I hope so. I mean, you can decide whether you're satisfied or not. I, I won't. I won't. Uh, I'm, I'm biased. You know, I, I could satisfy myself. It's okay. Um, but uh, this question of like this content representation—that's kind of what these mixed selectivity neurons do. Is they allow not only this high-dimensional representational space, but they allow the prefrontal cortex to scale its representation depending on the uh, dimensional demands of the task. So if I want to uh, have the animal learn conjunctions of things like, you know, red vertical line and blue horizontal line, this, and there's there's like um, 60 different conditions on a task, the animal has to has to learn all of them and all these combinations of items, the mixed selectivity neurons will do that at that level. But now I train the animal task where it takes a whole bunch of different stimuli and has to reduce them down to two groups, cat or dogs. And the mixed selecting neurons, they they now represent it at that particular on that uh on that level, on, on the uh where they throw away a lot of a lot of these they, they basically either expand their dimension, they expand, they adjust their dimensionality to meet the demands of the task. And the demands of the task could be a detailed representation of things or it could be a generalized principle, but that, that's what they're on Zoom. That's why I think we have so many of them in the in the prefrontal cortex. How the prefrontal cortex generates these high-level representations is a, 
interesting question. We have a um, lot. We have some speculation on, on that. If you look at the anatomy of the prefrontal cortex, you know it's like the the connections from the from the cortex down to the basal ganglia and back out through the thalamus are really interesting. So the prefrontal cortex it projects down to the striatum, then through two basal ganglia um, uh, indirect and direct pathways, then to the thalamus. Then the output of the thalamus sends projections back to the same part of the prefrontal cortex that sent the initial projections. So it's like a snake eating its tail. And when you see that in the brain, what I think is recursive processing, bootstrapping. And what's unique about that is, is the, so you have, so you add that recursive process, recursive processing is, um, so the system can learn something. Then once it learns it, once it changes, it could send the, that information back into the system for further elaboration. And some form of recursive processing, bootstrap, open-ended bootstrapping must explain the open-ended nature of Human, human thought and action. Now you add on to that this dopamine projection coming into the striatum, where you have this uh, when there's a reward or anticipation of reward, there's this shoot of dopamine into, into the um, striatum, which would gates pl plasticity. So as a result of this, we think there's this two level bootstrapping thing going on is that the striatum is a more primitive system. It evolved to learn the nuts and bolts, simple things really quickly. And it has a, this fast dopamine-gated plasticity allows it to do that. But then it sends projections up to the prefrontal cortex, where which is anatomically more complicated, has less of an influence of dopamine, and the prefrontal cortex has a slower changing plasticity. And that allows it to pick up on the commonalities across all the things the striatum has learned. And what those commonalities are, are high-level principles for guiding behavior. So think about it as the, the basal ganglia learns each fork in the road, but learns only that fork, what to do at that particular fork in the road. And that's what the basal ganglia learns, just what to do at that alternative. And what the prefrontal cortex does is take all those forks of the road and it builds a, a, a big map. This is what we refer to as like model-based versus mo model-free learning. Model-free learning is you're only, only learning the, the nuts and bolts. Model-based learning is what the prefrontal cortex does because it could take all these things that the basal ganglia has learned and then Combine them together by this by this uh, slow plasticity to find the commonalities among these patterns. So that's where I think this high level represent, representation may come from. Yeah, so that's wonderful. I mean, I I, I understand. You know, that is is that the, the the you you basically start talking about mixed selectivity and multidimensional representations, and basically, you know, that nice point you made about either cats and dogs versus all the features at a lower level that the mixed selective neurons can actually cope with either level of abstraction, and therefore by extrapolation, if I follow you you could probably get to even more abstract notions of, you know, animal, not just cat and dog or mammal or things like that. And, and that's where, yeah. And then, and then on the other side, when it comes to your control principles of populations of neurons and, you know, waves, that's the control principle at the level of mechanism that everyone was looking for when they were looking at the hydraulics of prefrontal cortex. So it seems that you've given the two key ingredients for the representations and the manipulation of those representations. And it seems as though there's something about prefrontal cortex, perhaps it's the fact that each neuron is connected to thousands of others, that it's the best place to create those high level representations. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's like the apex of these trends across the, across the cortex. It's the apex of the, exactly. In other words, it's the apex of both those trends. Uh, and, and now we're seeing kind of a more mathematical formalism beginning to apply to those two components and and that's what you're after. I mean, yeah. I think that's really fascinating. You that's know, I get summary. it. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Uh, after two and a half years of talking to John about the prefrontal cortex, this is the best uh, interaction I've seen with John about PFC <laughs> by anyone. This was beautiful to watch. All right, go, John. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to um, um, uh, ask a couple of questions before we go to uh, our questions from the audience. Hopefully I can be quick with this. Um, so let me start by saying um, there is a behavioral component to what I'm going to ask, and there is a kind of a PFC gradient and scale component that I want to talk about. In the uh, the, the PFC cascade gradient, uh, different parts of it. Um, I want to mention uh, some functional studies, but also some lesion studies, and also some um, uh, some studies of our own. Also, um, 
where it seems like every neuron in the PFC is not equally participating in whatever comes in. And it seems like there is some kind of a difference in different parts of the prefrontal cortex in a way that it's actually systematic. And it seems like there's some kind of architectural meaningful difference between different parts of the pre PFC. Specifically, my my favorite region is anterior PFC. That's where I, I the, the studies that I do and the kinds of research that I do usually kind of brings out that region. But um, it's very interesting to see the cascade. So just to give a, a brief overview, uh, uh, just to sync everybody about what I'm talking about. So um, when there is something in, uh, that I'm holding in my mind, a task that I'm going to do later, um, and my, the rest of my brain is busy doing something else, uh, it seems like anterior prefrontal cortex is good at keeping track of when to do the next task while I'm busy some, doing something else, which is called, you know, the behaviorally, it's called prospective memory, something I've, I've done a bunch of fMRI studies and modeling on. Now, if you um, uh, reach the moment where the brain decides, okay, this is the time I want to switch to the other task, there is like a cascade going backwards from the front of the brain, slowly backwards, and uh, gradually reaches the motor areas and the motor areas kind of like uh, decide what to do. And then I start to press a button or say something out loud if it goes to my language areas. Um, this cascade uh, goes through different parts of the PFC and each of them seems to have some kinds of properties that are not necessarily the same. So the lateral cascade seems to be more motor and action oriented, but the medial cascade seems to be more memory and uh, value oriented. Dorsally, mm -hmm. it seems to be a little bit more executive. Ventrally, it seems to be a little bit more driven towards value. And when you get different kinds of damage to these different sub components of the prefrontal cortex because of uh, accidents or um, uh, uh, strokes or various reasons that people get brain damage. Um, it seems like the the deficits are very different too. So if you get yeah. deficits to your orbitofrontal cortex right under your brain, then uh, you get something that is uh, more like gambling and uh, kind of uh, inability to um, control one's kind of um, uh, value-based decision-making. But if you get a damage to like a little bit more dorsal anterior prefrontal cortex, you might actually be great at working memory and IQ tasks, but you put we put you outside to go and run some errands and you just can't do it. Mm -hmm. Multitasking in the real world when you need to do a certain sort of number of uh, tasks becomes impaired. So for mm -hmm. instance, patients were given just a list of errands of like, go buy this from this yeah. shop, do this and post it there. And they just zigzagged across and couldn't finish the task. So it seems like this is very uh, compelling body of evidence. And I didn't even mention all the other kind of functional mm -hmm. stuff that seems to be suggesting everywhere in all the neurons in PFC are not doing the same thing. So it seems to me this is different from what at least I what I remember earlier versions of John Duncan's idea, which was that uh, all of it basically is doing the same thing. Although uh, yeah. you know, later. Nah, think about it. It's, it, it's a gradient in the prefrontal cortex, right? So the lateral prefrontal cortex is more connected with the um, sensory and motor system, the outside world. The medial and um, orbital, as you pointed out, are more concerned with uh, more connected to subcortical structures and midbrain structures. So they're more concerned with the internal state and things like reward values, stuff like that. But the, the, they're gradients, right? Yeah. And let's say the job of the prefrontal you know, lesion, lesion studies are great, but there's, you know, there's limits on, on, on how you interpret them. So first of all, if you get if you do a lesion, there's no effect. You don't really learn anything at all. It means you just left something in the brain that could still do it. It doesn't mean the thing you lesioned isn't doing it too. But let's say the job of the prefrontal cortex is to integrate uh, people do, uh, the outside world with value, right? So information about the outside world comes into the lateral prefrontal cortex. Information about internal state value comes into my medial prefrontal cortex. And what the prefrontal cortex does with this integrative anatomy is pull the two of them together, right? Now, if I do a lesion at this part of the prefrontal cortex, I've now deprived the entire prefrontal cortex from the input from the outside world, or I do a lesion on this part of the prefrontal cortex, I've now deprived the entire prefrontal cortex of information about value and internal state. That doesn't mean that this information is separate in the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex's job is to bring it together. You've just deprived the prefrontal cortex from one of the things that needs to integrate by doing that lesion. So 
leisure work like that, leisure work like that is more of a you're more like identifying anatomical um, bottlenecks than you are really assigning function. But just to go back to the fact that some of them are preferentially connected to some parts are co preferentially connected to different parts of the brain yep. already speaks to the fact that all the PFC is not doing, all the neurons in PFC cannot do the same thing or are not yeah. doing the same thing. Did anybody, did anybody ever say it, it was? Did anybody ever say that all the neurons in the prefrontal cortex? I thought that was the conclusion with John that what was the term that he said? He said oh, the, PFC yeah. specialized to be not specialized. It seems like there's yeah. different kinds of subspecialization within this PFC. Uh, but even John, I mean, John's work shows different places of activation in the prefrontal cortex for different tasks. What he, what he, uh, his main result is, is, is that these areas that can, they can swell if you, when, when there's greater cognitive demand, so you're recruiting more neurons. Um, that's consistent with, with some, with gradients and some degree of not specialization, but some degree of emphasis on, on one thing or, or, or another. Um, Maybe you're maybe you're probably more familiar than I am. I'm John's a good friend of mine, but I don't remember him saying that every part of the prefrontal cortex was like a mini Lashley-like cortex of equipotentiality. And I think his model of this demand network, where you're pulling, where you're recruiting more neurons, is still still consistent with some di degree of differences in gradients. Sorry, I meant this John, John Krakauer, like oh, a John. couple of minutes ago. You guys were saying um, PFC is specialized to not be specialized. The yeah. neurons, and so given that different neurons seem to be talking to different parts of the brain, and uh, with both functional studies, let's uh, I agree with you that lesions there's uh, caveats to them, but when you pair functional and lesion together, uh, plus the connectivity that you were mentioning, uh, that mm -hmm. different parts are preferentially connected to different parts of the brain. It seems like um, it makes more sense to think of the PFC architecture in terms of its subcomponents, gradients. I agree with you that there are gradients, not complete, kind of separated atomic categories. But it seems like it's important to talk about it in terms of those gradients as opposed to this whole bundle of not specialization, if that makes sense. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, I have like recorded a lot of prefrontal cortex for a yeah. while, and you see, you see, you see like more shape color stuff, you see it more ventrally, but you also see it dorsally, but it is more present ventrally. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. So yeah, it, it's the the compartmentalizing information would be antithetical to what the prefrontal cortex actually needs to do. But I've never um, argued that uh, that it's uh, uh, all parts of the prefrontal cortex do the same thing, because you're right, it does not correspond to the anatomy. Yeah, I that's not what I got from your work either. That's exactly right. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was given these, this architecture, um, it's very, it's, it's always been extremely interesting to me to finally be able to model all of the architecture together, because when we build computational models, we build some computational model of working memory. Maybe we, me and at least with John Cohen and Ken Norman, we built our, uh, computational models that combine working memory and episodic memory. Yeah. And that's already too much for some people. Well, that's great stuff. <laughs> but then if you want to focus on prefrontal cortex, like if we wanted to make, make even one minimal model of the whole prefrontal cortex, um, what do you think would be the minimal architecture, or minimal requirements to do that computationally? Because we, truthfully, we haven't really advanced models of the prefrontal cortex a lot, uh, as much as like hippocampus has advanced, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of the reason is that fewer of us obviously doesn't <laughs> prefrontal cortex work. It's not all species show a lot of prefrontal cortex uh, um, uh, activity or can do tasks that are engaging different parts of the PFC. Uh, but all of those caveats aside, just if we were thinking speculatively about um, beginning to take this task of not just building uh, models of some parts of the PFC, but actually building a computational model of the PFC. What do you think, or just like, not that you would know the full spectrum of answer like you were saying earlier, but what would you think would be the minimal criteria to do that? Well, I'm not a computational modeler, so my, 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 I work with computational modelers, but my, my thinking about the prefrontal cortex, first, my personal thinking is more on the uh, conceptual level. So I would bring in, I mean, I've got, I, you have to peel back to Miller and Cohen again, like you know, different parts of the prefrontal cortex designed to make these uh, these these connections. Um, the other things I would I would I would include in that are these recursive uh, these closed anatomical loops between the uh, 
prefrontal cortex too, the basal ganglia back out again, being hammered by uh, dopamine. Uh, the other thing, uh, the other thing I would say is that the update to the Miller and Cohen model, I would say, is, is one thing is 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 uh, the, these things, but also the idea that these oscillations are doing what what's doing the feedback control. But the other thing that we, we, we didn't think about back then, which we should have, is that the role of subcortical structures. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, cortex doesn't work alone. If the cortex, you can think of the cortex is a is a um, added feature to what was already going on in subcortical structures. You had a basal ganglia for voluntary movement control. You had a, a hippocampus doing memory. And what the, we had all those things before we evolved the cortex. And the cortex evolved to take all that stuff and do more of it in a more complex way. So you can't think about the prefrontal cortex unless you think about the, the basal ganglia, for example, mm -hmm. and these kind of loops and these interactions between the two and this balancing model-based and mo model-free learning. So that's another thing I would add is I would add this uh, two-level uh, um, um, learning uh, um, uh, architecture, and 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 you know the, the also you know along the lines of ignoring the, the subcortical structures. Like we thought about the Miller and Cohn model, from, you know, twenty uh, two years ago. Now um, we thought that is like a cortical cortical thing. But now we know that that, that um, if you look at the anterior thalamic nuclei, if you lesion them or deactivate them. The feed forward information, sensory information gets into the prefrontal cortex, but the feedback signals disappear. So the cortical structures play a critical role in, provi in, in, in providing that feedback. So that's another update I, I would make now. Interesting. Um, so I, I've worked a ton on, uh, I, I work in reinforcement learning a lot. So the, the, the strict the dichotomy of model-based, model-free, it doesn't happen in the brain. So there, we have a bunch of different models that are somewhere in between. Nothing cetera. is ever one yeah. or zero in the brain, yeah. you know, in the cortex and brain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate that you mentioned that. And I think it's um, it would be very interesting to see how uh, existing or state-of-the-art AI models, how they can be modified to have something like that. Because a lot of them, as Melanie was mentioning, are feed-forward. Um, but gradually... Yeah. But gradually, as we are having, uh, you know, like now the Bing search engine is going to run with GPT-4. So like as we are going to and the amount of data that it, it, a GPT model or a large language model gets trained with is equivalent of 5000 years of uninterrupted speech. <laughs> that's the amount it needs to be able to. I haven't heard that statistic before. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, that's the definitely not human level amount of input for learning. I definitely am not that old. But <laughs> um, but it's interesting that at some point uh, there's going to be a huge challenge of, um, like you were saying, the exact reason why PFC actually started to develop, which is how does it coordinate and control all of these things together, especially since being as a search engine also receives uh, feedback in terms of articles that are written about itself. It can, it, it has access to those. Yeah. And so that's why it shows meltdowns or things like that sometimes, which is very interesting to me. It's always been- um, The role of feedback of just, is yeah. so, so very important in Cortex. Yeah. I mean, the, the feedback connections are extensive in Cortex and they're not there just to like, a, you know, help the Cortex keep its shape. Um, and if you, know, you think about vision, you know, like uh, people don't see what's in front of them. They see what they expect to see. Your brain yeah. fills in a lot of the blanks there, which is why eyewitness testimony is like the worst evidence ever. So like, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you're sipping at the outside world through a straw and your brain's doing a lot of um, anticipating and filling in details and adding meaning. And that's all the feedback connections. So mm -hmm. yeah, work on that, please. <laughs> Um, another thing, fine, one last thing is the multi-scale nature of the representations and abstraction in the prefrontal cortex. Since the early 2000s, there's works on relational reasoning, uh, analogical reasoning, various kinds of things that, uh, let's say, anterior PFC gets involved, uh, at least in functional um, uh, fMRI studies that um, ha have on it. In my work, what, what, what I found was that prospective memory involves a lot of anterior PFC, especially the longer you have to uh, maintain that task while you're doing something else. And the more load you have in the ongoing task, as opposed to if you're just waiting to start, anterior PFC gets involved. Yeah. And um, there's also some work that um, uh, we published in January two years ago, just reanalyzing data that the Moscovich lab generously gave us people were navigating inside a virtual reality version of Toronto. Sometimes in some trials, they knew 
where they were going and they were using their cognitive maps to navigate. In some other trials, they were being told by an arrow which way to go. And in the ones where they knew where they were going, even though the distances were the same, about one to something, one to three kilometers, uh, it was interesting that you got more representation of future states or further away uh, in more anterior regions, but you couldn't find those multi-step, multi, -step, multi um, yeah. Uh, the further representations, successor representations, you couldn't find them in posterior uh, PFC regions. It was like a nice gradient that we have in the paper. Um, so I was wondering what you think about this multi-scale nature um, in the gradients of the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, I know you're working on this really, really great work. And, and it also reminds me of David Better's work on, yes. on this topic too, where if you, yeah. if you train people, some very brave uh, um, and hardworking students, by the way, who must have been involved in this experiment. You're trying to do a simple task and you keep bringing them back and add multiple layer, higher le level le levels of control on top of the task. And you see the representations of prefrontal cortex, they go from motor cortex for the simple task and more and more anterior, the more high up you get in this, in this overarching hierarchical control, control structure. Uh, so yeah, it's totally consistent with that. And you know, the thing about these representation, you mentioned off perspective memory off into the future. The thing about these generalized representations, whether it's cat or dog or number or same versus different or uh, whatever we're talking about, the ability to generalize across many things in the, in the present also endows with it the same ability to generalize from the present into, into the future. So the fact that humans are so good at getting, you know, think, think about humans are like a hypothesis generators. If you, you say you train an animal on, here's a, here's a, a famous task where you train an animal on a task where, or human on a task where an object appears on the top of the screen or bottom of the screen. And they have to press a button as soon as the object appears, right? Simple as that, just press. And then you start having them anticipate where, where the thing is going to appear. So let's say the, Object appears 80% of the time on the top of the screen, 20% on the bottom. And you train an animal and a, and, a, and a human to do that task. What do animals do? They do the smart thing. They respond 100% of the time on the top so they can get all the maximized reward because that's 80% of the time. That's where the thing is going to be. What do humans do? They match probabilities and they miss a lot of rewards. Mm. The human brain wants to be, sometimes it's too clever. It, it wants to figure out, you know, what's going on here. And in this case, it's almost like the brain wants to demonstrate to the investigator, oh, I know what's going on. You know, you, 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 I'm not going to maximize my reward. I'm going to show you that how, how clever, clever I am. And that's what the human brain does. It's very good at generalizing, very good at generalizing. And the same thing that gives us this ability to generalize and get these general principles to figure out what, what the deal is going on here, it's the same thing that allows us to general, generalize into the future, make, make the human brain and, and our prefrontal cortex so prospective. Thank you so much. I, I, I would love to chat a lot more about the stuff that we are doing now, but that's for another time. And we're going to go to the questions now. Thank you so much. This is so Thank wonderful. You. Just, just one point, Earl. I mean, it's yeah, actually feedback, important for feedback. I mean, as far as I know, the ratio of projections down from cortex to thalamus to neurons coming out of thalamus to cortex is 10 to 1. In other words, there's a massive larger projection down to these regions making your point right in other Tell words it, yeah, whatever, yeah. Whatever, whatever whatever this cortical subcortical arrangement is the cortex cares a lot about it because it projects yes. down <laughs> right right so that's an excellent high. point john yeah, yeah 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 how much of these are coming from the pfc i don't actually know the answer to that i i i, I was um what's his name the the maven of thalamus um the Maven told me that. Um, was it Murray? Murray? Oh, Murray uh, Sherman. Murray Sherman told me this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was amazed at that ratio. Um, I don't yeah. remember. I don't know actually either if it's PFC. PF, yeah. Maybe it's a general cortical. To I think again. it's a general cortical phenomenon. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we're going to start our questions uh, from the audience with uh, two questions that were the highest voted. And uh, Imran, do you want to ask your question first? Because I think your question was initially the highest voted. Yeah, please go ahead. You're muted, so now you're on. OK, uh, thank you. And thanks for the talk. Thank um, you. Yeah, so uh, I guess I was um, I was just thinking, like, it like it seems like you, I mean, I, I it's, it's great. Like, I, I'm looking forward to like reading more about brainwaves and stuff because I haven't thought much about this stuff, but about brainwaves in particular. But 
So you talk about brainwaves as being kind of, it seems like, I mean, you don't use the word representation a lot, although I think I might have heard it a couple of times, but you do kind of think of them as like signals and carrying information. And it's natural. I mean, some it's people more, think more like, like it might be not. Yeah, the, the low frequency brainwaves, the patterns of them carry top down information, the patterns of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the synchrony. Right. So if you want to say that they carry information, it seems like the information has to be used by something and it has to be read out in some way. So I was curious mm -hmm. what you have, like if you have any thoughts on what exactly is the mechanism for reading out the information and what exactly is reading out the information or what's using the information in the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, the, it, the problem gets a little bit hom homuncular at the end. Like, what is the thing that's that's reading all this stuff on the brain? I don't think I don't think there is actually a homunculus problem because I think that the uh, the, the controls are the controls and emergent property of these of these net networks act, act, acting together. And uh, so that's what it's not sort of like the brain needs something. I mean, downstream neurons need to read out, read out information, right? And neurons that are receiving protection need to read out information. But how the brain in general reads out information. Um, it isn't, it, there's not one area or one thing. It's an emergent property of, of all, the, all these all these things uh, um, doing doing their thing, rather than a, um, a homunculus sort of like being the final arbitrator. That was hand waving because that's. I mean, I still want to like I still want to <laughs> push back a little bit on that just because. Please. I mean, well, I guess there's there's issues in general with like talking about like what reading out information is, but like you yeah. might think downstream neurons are reading out information from upstream neurons. Mm -hmm. But like this seems like something more specific. Like there's like a high level pattern in how like the whole population of neurons is behaving that's yeah. captured in the brainwave. And yeah. I'm wondering how the downstream neurons read out that information in particular. Well, I think as what's opposed going to on... just the signals from the upstream neurons, which are like a lower level. And it kind of connects with the epiphenomenalism. So like you want to you want to say that we don't know that it's not epiphenomenal. And I think you think it's not epiphenomenal. So it's not just like this phenomenal thing. It's like this thing that's actually being read out downstream yeah. and being well, used I actively. Yeah, I don't think anything is that be phenomenal at this point in the game because none of us know anything about how the brain works. So to call like a signals you can measure from the brain that be phenomenon is just uh, no one has that kind of information. And that's just a uh, model defending. Um, but you're right. I mean, so sure. with, the, with these patterns, so really in the end, the brain's got to do things by representing information, right? So these these this knowledge that this these top down patterns of information that that the brain is the frontal cortex is sending to the rest of the cortex are reflecting top down information in that in that pattern of activity they create. So that pattern comes from representation. Again, these representations get built up by these interactions with the uh, with the um, basal ganglia until you boot up a representation that has a that has a, a, a model of what to, what to do. And then this then the Top-down information is represented in that model, and it influences how other neurons and cortex process, process information. And that's all it needs to do, really, is influence how other neurons process information, and then connect that to a motor system when you have behavior, and how we get consciousness is something I don't know. I see. So it's like a high-level constraint on it. It's kind of like similar to the checkerboard idea that you were mentioning before. And it's yeah. like a high-level constraint on how the neurons are behaving. Exactly. Do we have to call it information in, in that sense? Well, in the sense if that if, I it, could... if it doesn't have to be read out by a specific mechanism, but it's just constraining high level patterns of how the neurons behave. Well, there's a different type of information. So bottom up information is the content like okay. John and I were talking about. But top the top down information, this control, it also is inf information too. It's information about the operation that needs, needs to be performed. And, you know, if you look at these patterns of, uh, of brainwave coherence, you can actually read the uh, the information. I like that slide I showed where you get different patterns of uh, synchrony for one rule versus the other. I could read those patterns and tell you what rule the animal is following. So I am reading information from the brain from them. Well, you are, but I guess I was wondering how the neurons are. <laughs> so, which is like, like we can read the information, but then yeah. Well, again, I think I think it's the neurons too. Yeah, I think I think it's, I think I, I get to what you're getting. It, it's again this idea that these are control signals that control where information is, is being expressed, and that's really the only readout you need in, in this case. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much for that question. Um, uh, next question, please go ahead. Hi. Hi. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm confused with one one question is that you you have you have been talking about control for 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 what? But like, I, I'm confused. Like, so who is controlling who? Like, <laughs> like it's like my neurons controlling my thoughts, my thoughts controlling this traveling wave. Like, like what's the what's the agency there? I, like, like if like if, if I take the view, it's like you have a highly dimensional ensemble dynamic space, yeah. and then my thought is traveling. It seems I'm hopeless. To control my thoughts. Well, or like the, my thought. the short answer to that is yes. All of it's it's all part and parcel of the, of the same thing. Spikes and waves, and they form representations, and then you get emergent properties, and the cortex gets on the same page, synchronizes, and you, you have a you can't have consciousness. What's control? Control has to be in the way the the brain represents information. It has to be because that's what the brain does. It's essentially representing information and then those representations control other representations. So the top down control will be in those patterns. Now, as for what's controlling it, as for what's actually making the uh, do this or do that, well, you know, we'll probably spend the rest of my life and probably the rest of your life figure, figuring that out. The brain is uh, very complicated and I don't have any, any good answer to that. Um, yet, and probably won't, I probably won't see one, but again, we have, we think that these bootstrapping operations that, that build up these representations, these control representations that represent the control operations that can feed back to the rest of the cortex, that's where, that's where the con control comes from. And then maybe it's a matter of just, you know, they're associated with different, they're different strengths associated with different reward history and whatnot. And then there's context and, and um, cues that could pop up a certain representation you need it for that control at, at a given moment. And then control comes out of that because now, now that the pattern is activated, it can now gain control over, over the rest of the cortex. So it may be as simple or as complex, complex as that. You don't but, really need an agent performing things. You need to just pull up the right representation with the right cues, the, with the right associations. And, and also how can, how can just one thing, um, you know, Melanie is, question, Melanie is a fully fledged uh, professor at the Santa Fe Institute. I'm a nepotistic member of the Santa Fe Institute. <laughs> um, and But one of the interesting concepts, going back to Laughlin and Anderson, my brother's actually given a nice talk about this recently, is one of the points they made is that everyone agrees that wholes act differently to the individual parts. But the deep idea in emergence with top-down causality is that the parts behave differently when they're in holes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it works both ways, what, doesn't it? Yeah. It works both ways. So I think the point that Earl is making is that once you get the whole moving, it is going to actually have a top-down effect on the parts. If you believe yeah. that version of emergence. Now, I think the point is that if you don't invoke that part type of emergence and you simply use the word for holes act differently from parts, that's actually weak tea. And in fact, even reductionists like Steve Weinberg wouldn't disagree with that. Oh yeah, no, no, yeah, that's, yeah, no, I'll be able to, yeah. Yeah, like the deep point is that parts behave differently in holes because of what the hole does to them. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, emergence is, is right. It isn't just like a you know this property. It's a, a, emergence is a property you can you have to detect by the whole, but the whole but it work it feeds back in, in the opposite direction too, and 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 that's the whole idea of this top down control. So some so, other control is coming from this emergence that's then feeding back to control the parts. So uh, I will follow up with another question, uh, pretty quick. Um, so 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 when you talk about oscillations, so why do you think oscillation is just as like a orthogonal emergent properties, uh, just like the agency or consciousness, like in proven cortex, rather than it has a really important computational roles or like in that. And uh, uh, like, how would you like to test that? Like this kind of causality, maybe like the, like the, like for example, the Messi have his wave of his legs, like five Hertz. If you, if that's different, you can, you can do an experiment that you don't allow Messi to, to walk in five hertz and then he become really bad at uh, soccer and then i said like that that frequency oh, yeah. is like fundamental to his performance in football but how what, what kind of experiment would you, can you imagine or why do you think that's uh that has a causality like oscillation as a computational substrate that has causality yeah. to uh conscious uh, uh, well, 
we are doing those experiments. We've done those experiments and other people are doing them as well. So for example, to go up to all the human level, um, we, were we were trying to do some experiments on closed loop electrical stimulation where you read these oscillations from the brain. Then you have a system that does real fast read write latency and then you can stimulate in time with the rhythm. So you can either enhance them or anti-phase stimulation, you can tap them down. So we're gonna do these causality like like ex experiments, but we've already done a lot, a lot of this. You can demonstrate in, in mice and humans that is that when you when you match ongoing endogenous oscillations in the brain, you actually improve function, and if you disrupt them, you disrupt function. One example is that we had um we were testing our closed loop system in human surgical patients, and they had electrodes in their um, internal capsule for reasons they oh, for they were uh, thinking of being treated for OCD. And the kernel capsule has these theta rhythms, and theta rhythms is important for it helps generate and sculpt gamma rhythms in cortex. So what we did is we had the uh, the uh, we did this closed loop stimulation of the internal capsule, reinforcing the natural theta rhythms in, in, in internal capsule, and it increased activity in the prefrontal cortex. And the humans got better at a, at a cognitive demanding task and not a simple motor task. And if you do the same stimulation by stimulating randomly. Where you don't pay attention to the ongoing rhythms, then you actually disrupt behavior. So if you're if you're enhancing an endogenous rhythm in the brain and you're actually improving brain function, that's you know evidence that these oscillations are playing playing a role in brain function. As Charlie Gross used to say, anybody can screw up the brain. If you can improve the brain, you've really gotten somewhere. Thank you so much for the question. Thank we you. have. Um, address two out of 17 questions. So I'm just gonna do a, the faster ones really quick because there were some fun questions also from uh, Karim Jerby who's a professor in Montreal. So I'm just gonna make sure that we get to the different questions that are here. Elizabeth asks, please kindly ask for me, does mixed cell activity allow redundancy in case of injury? And second, how do these oscillations work when selecting competing actions? Well, sorry, the first question. Yeah, yes, mixed selectivity allows the kind of redundancy you need to have a brain that grades it gracefully. And, you know, neurons are dying in your brain, especially if you have a night of drinking, and you need a brain that can degrade grace gracefully. And that's really important. And the mixed selectivity neurons is one um, one property that allows that because it allows information to be distributed across neurons that are being specialized in just a few neurons. So they allow that kind of like um, extra robustness that, that, are, that are, our brains need. Yes. And her second question uh, was about um, how to how these oscillations work when selecting competing actions, which I guess would say something about the role of ACC. Yeah, so the way it would work is that you would, uh, yeah, these for the oscillations are really important in the motor cortex. And we just say the motor system will say, yeah, oscillations are, they've were way, way ahead of the game on this. And you get these different patterns of oscillations and different permissive. Uh, uh, things with one action or another, and you could change the pattern of synchrony, either either funnel activity towards towards one action or towards another action. And what's also interesting about the um, about the uh, motor system is that these two frequent, different frequency brain waves, the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies, you can see the kind of top-down control gating operation I'm talking about by recording in motor cortex. So in motor cortex, for example, you um, have a person, you give them a button and say, press the button as soon as I say, but I'm going to, don't do it yet. Wait, I'm going to tell you. And what happens is that the whole time they're waiting to make the response, the lower frequencies go up and they, they, they tamp down the high frequencies. So that's like, a, that's like a braking signal, the foot's on the brake. Then the moment the person gets the go response, the low frequencies drop. That allows the high frequency to be expressed. And neurons start spiking and the person presses the button. So just right there, just by balancing, think of the oscillations as not just things, but they're energy states of the same network. When you have high frequencies, there's lots of spiking, lots of energy. When you have more moderate speed, um, um, energy, you get mid middle of levels of spiking. And that's what that is. They're, they're different. You're flipping the brain to two different energy states. And if one energy state, the lower frequencies, um, if they don't allow a lot of spiking because it's a low energy state, if you force a network into lower oscillations, you're going to be forcing into a low energy state where it can't do things like push the button. But the moment you relax those, uh, take away those low frequency oscillations, then then the, uh, the network can go up to a high energy state and the button gets pressed. I think they may, they might have been asking about choosing between two different top down actions when they are competing oh, with each other. Yeah, How yeah, the yeah. oscillations yeah. kind of um, yeah, well, there's some examples where you have like two, well, um, 
about competing actions, there's competing like memories in the hippocampus. And what you see is you see theta rhythms in the hippocampus. You see them sync. One, one part of the hippocampus will synchronize to another part of the hippocampus at different phases of theta rhythms, depending on which memory the, the, the um, rat wants to read out, which memory the rat is using at a, at a given moment. So it's a kind of that routing operation where you're, you, you're changing the pattern of oscillations to funnel, get certain neurons to communicate with one another, and now you choose that action v v versus the other. So it may literally be the, the shifting patterns of, um, of uh, oscillations that allow the brain to funnel information either towards one response or a competing response. And what does the actual flipping, the, 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 uh, the, the, that's the kind of like, that's the question that what actually controls the top-down control is going to be uh, something that we're going to be working on for a very long time. Um, and since you mentioned um, phase, I think that relates to a question I saw here. Uh, can you comment on the causal direction? If LFPs are emergent, is it typical to think of LFPs being caused by the neurons in the network themselves rather than the LFPs causing the neural activity? which might be required if the LFP is supposed exercise, supposedly exercises higher level control organization of neurons. Yeah, so it's gonna be both because the spikes create the LFPs, the LFPs are part of the, part of the spikes. So, so the causality goes in both directions. You, you get the spikes creating these oscillations and the oscillations reinforce themselves and keep the neurons or the spiking organized and on track. Or it could go the other way and you see examples of both in the brain. For example, we have a, paper in the pipeline where if you look at the um, top down and bottom up effects, you can see that there's a fact of, what's called a fact of coupling where the gamma oscillations are actually driving the spiking, not the other way around. You don't, you don't get spikes and then gamma. The gamma is driving the spiking. But then you look at it when the animal switches to another mode, a top down mode, you see that it goes the other direction where the spiking starts driving, in this case, the lower frequency beta oscillations. And um, my, my colleague Dimitris Pinosis has a nice paper he's work, working on where we show us a, he shows us a fact of coupling at the level level of cortex is that you can actually um, generate can, can calculate the electric fields then you ask the question using various causality measures what's coming first is it the underlying neural activity or is it the overall structure what's driving what and you know it changes from time to time but you see a lot of um, driving of the, of the waves actually driving the spiking and how did the waves do that? Well, what waves are? They're fluctuating electric fields. And when neurons spike is they have a membrane potential. And the membrane potential goes up and down like the electric field. And when the membrane potential reaches a certain threshold, the neuron spikes, right? So that's what these fluctuating electric fields do. They're driving neurons. They're changing the membrane potential and driving neurons up and down towards spiking. And it can work both ways. The spike creates the waves. Then the waves can turn around and modify change and even, and even drive spiking. Thank you so much. A uh, short question. Are there any neurons that don't display mixed selectivity by Isaac? Yes, there, yes, there are neurons. I mean, especially in lower cortical areas, um, especially in, and if you go down to the subcortex, you get a lot of neurons that do highly specialized things like regulate heart rate and respiration and whatnot. So there's a lot of neurons in the uh, central nervous system that are, are very highly specialized. I think that the mixed selectivity is more a product of cortex. Having said that, I just saw reports, I've seen reports of mixed selectivity in the olfactory bulb and whatnot. So it's probably a general principle for how the brain can do better computation. But you see a real apex. You see the most mixed selectivity in cortex. And we think we tend to see it. It's a, it's a trend where it really reaches the most mixed selectivity neurons seem to be in, in, the, in the prefrontal cortex, in the higher order areas. Ayuno asked a um, question to speaker as well as the hosts. If AIs were given the oscillatory function like the brains, uh, what do you think the AI will gain? Uh, well, it'll gain flexibility. It'll, it'll be like Skynet. It'll gain the world. Um, <laughs> uh, Solving AGI here. <laughs> yeah. So don't do it. Um, no, the... the, the, um, the um, what they gain is they gain, gain flexibility. So if you have a network and you want to use use the um, current way current network models are done, or the way the way uh, the clockwork way I was thinking about the brain, where it's all spikes and wires, if you want to change what the network does, you have to rewire it. You have to break connections. You have to make new connections. That takes time, and it doesn't that doesn't endow the brain with flexibility. But now you have all this these connections that represent the latent knowledge of the brain the stored memories, the stored information, all been tuned up. 
ready to be expressed. And now you have these waves that can channel activity along along the networks in different ways, expressing different information um, in di when the when the wave hits that that network, and that gives the brain flexibility because now you have a mechanism for where you can take all the information and express it in a very flexible way. It depends on how the waves are flowing flowing across the networks. So what it gives, it gives the brain flexibility and cognition is flexibility. That's what, that's what cognition is. Simple creatures respond reflexively. Our ability to engage complex behavior depends on our ability to think flexibly. Thank you for that. Uh, Karim Jerby has asked a couple of interesting questions, so uh, hopefully I can, they had to leave, they are already 23 minutes late to a meeting because of this, so yeah. <laughs> they could stay longer. Uh, there is a large body of evidence pointing to the role for higher frequency gamma activity in cognition, broadly speaking. Earlier yeah. work often uh, confused actual changes in gamma oscillations with changes in broadband gamma activity. Yeah which many believe reflects a change in the aperiodic component or slope yep. of the power spectrum, yep. no link to oscillations. Do you attribute a functional role to non-oscillatory broadband, um, broadband gamma activity? Sure, given that it's neural activity, it's going to have, a, have an impact and a function on spiking activity. So what broadband a aperiodic uh, gamma is probably reflecting is mainly, mainly spiking activity post-epispecting activity. Of course, that's going to have a big impact uh, on function. Um, yeah, we're, that's you bring up a very important point because it's really easy to mistake a non-oscillatory signal of the brain as oscillatory. So you got to do things. You have to you have to um, remove aperiodic components, and you also look to, to look to an endogenous um, um, oscillations. You also got to do things to get to make sure you're actually looking at. You, know, you can't just look at the frequency output. You got to look at make sure you got to look at actually the actual fluctuations and make sure you're actually seeing multiple cycles of a signal, for example. So we're very we're in our work we're very uh, careful on what we call in oscillations. And when gamma since it's so easy to mistake for spiking, we all, we all usually only look at gamma up to about 100 hertz or so. And we also look at uh, the gamma we look at is very narrow band and it changes frequency, but it's very narrow band, right? So that's a true oscillation because aperiodic and and and, and um, gamma due to um, spiking is very broadband, such as across wide like a wide range of frequencies. So we're careful to isolate what we think are true oscillatory events, but it's really easy to uh, have false positives on that. So you got to be careful. The second question Carrie Mass is uh, AI research claims to have embedded attention, which is not the same as attention in for us. It's a little bit more close to um, indexing that hippocampus does, the notion of attention in uh, ANNs, by building transformers. An expert in the neural underpinning, uh, do you feel that this is naive or very naive? Oh, okay, this was practice. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to go with naive. <laughs> is it naive or very naive? Like, yeah. those, are yeah, those are my choices. Huh? All yes. of the above. <laughs> Super naive. And then their other question uh, is, wouldn't work using oscillatory neurostimulation to drive oscillations in the brain and observe uh, cognitive and behavioral effects like periodic stimulation, stimulation using various modalities provide key insight into the causal and functional role of oscillations uh, to counter the epiphenomenon claim? Absolutely, and that work has been done. You see it all over the place. If you, if you if you read signals from a brain and you match the endogenous oscillations of the brain, the rhythm of the brain, you can actually improve function, get greater plasticity. And if you ignore these oscillatory signals and just stimulate randomly, it's actually either non-effective or it's disruptive because it's like throwing a gear randomly in a machine and hoping it lands in the, in the right place. So there's lots of examples where you, you actually make networks and brains work better by enhancing these natural rhythms. Um, another question was, again, about the homunculus controller that was answered, and the Pablo who had asked it also mentions, hey, I, I realized this was answered to another question, so that's nice. You already preemptively <laughs> answered it. Uh, Tao asks, do you think LFP plays a role in the bottom-up processes as well? Well, the LFP plays a role in, um, in um, trafficking bottom-up spiking through the cortex. It's a very local phenomenon. And what it does on the local level organizes spiking, but it also helps feed it forward through, 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 through cortex. And in this um, um, paper, forthcoming paper, we actually see that. We see when there's a bottom-up sensory input, it's the 
network is going to the gamma state, and the gamma state then creates this high energy state that produces lots of spiking. So it actually is causal in, in that way, and that the gamma is creating the spiking and, help, and help, helping it feed forward. Now, because gamma is a local phenomenon, it tend to be very, very local, it can't really feed forward very, it's a weak feed forward signal. Mm -hmm. So gamma tends to um, cross frequency couple to theta rhythms in cortex, and that's what we think theta does. Theta is this lower frequency signal that the gamma can ride on and helps the gamma push forward through cortex. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. There it is. Uh, this one. Is there an extent to which newer methods of dimensionality reduction and spiking data and then subsequently framing them in dynamical systems are getting at the same information that LFPs are already providing? Sorry, I didn't quite get that. I didn't get it either. Um, Mitch Morningstar is asking whether new methods of dimensionality reduction in spiking data and then framing them in dynamical systems can get what LFPs are providing, or do we really need separate measurement of LFPs? I think that's what they're saying. Well, yeah, I would, I mean, like we, um, we measure them both. I mean, they work together and you, what you see, so neurons don't fire continually. What they do is they, they fire, then they go to a refractory period and they fire. So they, even spiking activity inherently is, is a, is a, is a um, periodic, uh, signal right so I, I think it's a mistake to think about them as as uh, two different things they're part of the same process they're all feeding together and reinforcing one another and there's no such thing as spiking versus lfps it's all together it's all the same different measures of the same thing essentially yeah that's i think that's reasonable but i think they're asking whether you can just recover lfps from spiking data without having to measure it separately Oh, interesting. So we did a um, 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 brain machine interface experiment a while back. I mean, these electrodes in, in the animal's head, and the animal had to do a spatial work, um, delayed response task. Mm -hmm. um, Q allocation, then what, wait the animal, wait, then the animal has to go, oh, we're over there, or Q, over there, right? And what we did is we, um, we tried to um, see if the animal can perform a task, not by actually making an overt motor response, but by using their mind, using their brain, right? And we tried. To, we did this as a way of testing how can we best do this. Mm -hmm. We looked at um, oscillations. We looked at LFPs. We looked at spiking activity, and the, and it actually, was, tell you the results are pretty amazing. If you figure out which what you, what works best, and then feed it back to the animal, after a while the animal figures out it doesn't need to move its um, arms anymore and it starts doing the task with just its brain waves. Mm -hmm. That's what was the result. Is that we had a lot of spikes in there, but we could not get an accurate enough signal to do it in real time and spiking activity. But when we looked at broadband gamma, we could. Now that makes sense because because broadband gamma is going to be covering both the real gamma oscillations and a lot of like mass spiking. But that makes sense because you're integrating more information over a larger number of neurons. So so uh, yeah, so it's uh, you can you can again read the information out on, on the LFP level, but you're not just reading LFPs out of our oscillations, you're also reading the spiking in a, in a kind of indirect way. Maybe one last question, and then maybe the if, if any of the hosts have any questions, they can also add to that. Um, uh, oh, I lost the question for some. Oh, here it is. Uh, David Murphy asks, sensory input presumably happens asynchronously to the oscillations occurring in the brain. The motor system also presumably needs to match the timing of the external world. It does. So mm -hmm. is the strict timing information lost somewhere along the hierarchy of processing, or is it retained in phase with the oscillations, like the oscillations are a tapestry on which the precise timing occurs or something right. else. Yeah, great question. I refer you to the work of Charlie Schroeder who works on active sensing. So what that is, is, is the brain sensory system, it matches its rhythms to, to the rhythms of the world. So the simple experiment is you have the animal pay attention to either an auditory cue or a visual cue or to visual cues, and they're coming in at different frequencies. And when you cue the animal to pay attention to one of those information streams, the co co cortex wave, the, the oscillations start matching the, the waves of, of the channel animal, the periodic um, input of, of the whatever channel the animal is paying attention to, right? So the idea is that the, the brain um, matches its rhythms to match the incoming sensory input. And we think about this, this is what happens in the, with theta in, in the, um, in the hippocampus, the animal sniffing four times a second, you get theta and stuff in the cortex too, where your eyes are moving around about four times a second. So there's a lot of this periodic stuff where the brain is um, matching the rhythms to the outside world. 
And if you think about, I mean, the entire universe is really is is oscillatory. Everything down from subatomic particles up to like you know changing of the seasons. So of course, the, the your brain your brain is also an oscillatory machine. It's going to naturally you know match some of these rhythms to the uh, to the both the inputs and the outputs of the world. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I have yes, another please, question. Um, so, uh, given all this work, and you've and you've obviously pioneered all not, this, not in, me alone, but yeah. human primate. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But you know, let, you know, let, let me, let me <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, do you, you know, you know, uh, Steve Wise and Dick Passingham and others mm -hmm. have very much made a case for the evolution in mammals of the granular prefrontal cortex. Um, and do you do you think the story that you're building in the non-human primate, um, you know, a lot of people do reversal learning in in the mouse and the rat. Mm -hmm. Is there any, in your view, a qualitative change in principles? as you move across mammalian granular cortex in the mouse, the primate, the human, or do you think that these are general principles that could have been worked out? Uh, what's the difference between, yeah. I mean, I'm just curious for your view, in other yeah, words. It's, it's all going to be a gradient, you know, like, uh, sure, mice are good, at, uh, mice are bad at reverse learning, but they can learn reverse learning and, and rats are a little better at it, but they take, it's very hard to train them to do instantaneous reversal. Something you can a primate brain could do could do right so away. What is it? So, so on that, so why? I mean, if someone asked you, what is it that allows the you got the more of this stuff up here to develop these generalized principles where you can, where you can so plug is it, information? Is it just in. about being? Is it just about being more? Well, that's a large part of it. I mean, like the size of the prefrontal cortex in, for example, a cat or a dog is five percent of cortex. In humans, it's, it's a third of the cortex. So there's, it's the part of your brain that's most phylogenetically different from 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 low, from other. Yeah, I mean, species. as you know, there's been a lot of work, right, trying to see, you know, is it really that much larger as a function of scale? You know, are there? Well, it's not going to be only. Not going to be just larger. I mean, there's some special property to to. Uh, there's been reports of like special neurons in the uh, in in the human brain. I don't um, know how to fit that into this the prefrontal cortex models yet. But I will say there was this nice study that's guy named Tony Wright did many years ago now, where he he trained um, humans, monkeys, uh, every, and a couple of species, then pigeons, all to do a simple matching task respond when two things are the same, two red circles or two blue circles, and don't respond when they're different, red and blue or blue and, ye blue and yellow. And he didn't give any of the species any instructions at all. Just said, figure it out. So the humans, and, and they start with just three alternatives. Who did, who did this? Who did this? Can Tony we put that Wright. in the Tony, Tony Wright, his name is. And um, you. you're welcome. And um, so you start, you train the species to question up with just three objects, right? And then they do the task. And the moment they do the task, you add in a fourth object. Then the moment they can do the task with fourth, you add a fifth one in. And the metric is how many, much experience does it take each species to learn the general principle of matching or, or same, right? Humans being great hypothesis uh, generators, you train a human with, they figure out the task with just three objects. You add the fourth one, boom, they're right there. They already know it. Rhesus monkeys, I think the answer was, I think I'm making up some numbers here because I read this experiment like 30 years ago, but um, rhesus monkeys took something like 56 stimuli before the monkeys finally got the uh, the uh, general principle, and pigeons, it was something like 250 stimuli, and they were only just starting to pick it up. And so do you this is a bit hand-wavy, this has been hand-wavy if I made my point, but yeah. you plot that, all, all the species did, and plots a lot with the, um, it correlates anyway with the size of the uh, relative size of the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, but I mean, it gets to something that I just talked about, you know, is are we talking about a, an extra set of algorithms that come along with the substrate? In other words, are we talking about qualitatively new computational capacities? In other words, I'm just trying to understand, yes, one can say the substrate has simply gotten larger. Yeah. But does that mean that a new set of algorithms have come along? Um, because then we get into a paradox, which is saying, well, we're going to say it's getting larger, but we're not going to claim that anything has fundamentally changed with respect to the computations yeah. going on between subcortical and cortical structures. 
So where's the difference that makes the difference? Can I just say something? Um, the algorithms don't necessarily come baked in. Like for instance, the algorithm either for counting or speaking Farsi or writing poetry or playing the cello, they don't come with my prefrontal cortex. Yeah. But my prefrontal cortex has the ability of learning all of those and math and programming languages, et cetera, right? right. So Why? But, but Why? wait, wait, the, the thing that I just wanted to say, you said, are the algorithms coming with it? No, no, I didn't say that. I said, I said, are, are the algorithms that allow you to do the things you just listed qualitatively different algorithms that the ones that the macaque and the pigeon used to solve the problem? In other words, did the human solve the problem in a rapid aha moment? Because qualitatively, what it had available to understand yeah. with was different. And I just, I'm, I'm finding it, you know, saying it's just larger sounds like a continuum, but at the same time, it seems that qualitatively what they did cognitively is distinct. Well, first of all, I, I can't hard to answer that question without knowing what these algorithms are. So I can't say they're they're qualitatively different, but I haven't identified we haven't identified them. So, but I suspect that it's going to be a continuum. I suspect that the, these are all trends in the on the phylogenic scale that just reaches a, a, apex in the human brain. That's my gut feeling feeling about that. Because when you think about experiments like that, you see all these approximations of human behavior in different animals, just less so, or it takes longer. So. I suspect that it's going to be a matter, I don't want to be as glib as say it's, oh, it's just more stuff, but it's, it is kind of more stuff and more ter to, to, to develop these high level re representations. And also don't forget, it's not just like, you, when we were talking about like equipotentiality and cortex, we're talking about things like these hierarchical structure and gradients. Maybe the human brain has a larger prefrontal cortex, so there's more levels of hierarchy you, you could layer on to solving a task. I also think there's a lot of evidence that these abilities come with language. You know, these special human abilities are only available because we're able to have this kind of extra thing that's, that we can map. That is a that's uh, a great point because language is um, highly symbolic. So you know, the word justice mean, means a lot. It mean, it stands for a lot of different things. And high level concepts and abstractions are the ultimate form of data compression in, in, in your brain. If you have a word you have a concept of justice you don't need to think about all the times you were treated justly or unjustly you have this word then you could plug the, in, into different situations and that's important because the human consciousness is very limited in capacity we're very narrow bandwidth when it comes to how we're thinking about things consciousness is, and, and um you know if you have if you could compress the data and deal with it on a higher level, that means you could solve more complex problems because you don't need to sweat the details. And language was a step up w w when it comes to data so compression. We've had this, we've had this. I'm sorry, John, do you want to say something? Well, we've had this discussion on the show before, but you know, language is a discontinuity. I mean, even animal biologists will claim that language is a unique you know, quality. Yeah, so I was about to say, so if there is a how are you get your, So how are you going to get your continuum of language is only present in humans? I was about to say, if there is a qualitative leap, it may be language. But that's not even prefrontal cortex, is it? It's frontal cortex. It's close enough. Why, why, why are we carving up things so, so <laughs> But I'm just saying temporal parietal is very important, right? For, I mean, well, the, but, yeah, the, anyway. <laughs> the point is, it's, it's providing this highly compressed data stream that the prefrontal cortex can use. That's what language does. So if there's, if there is a qualitative difference, maybe if if there is one, maybe language is a, is a key part of it. Yeah, because yeah. it's so symbolic. Yeah. I also want to bring up uh, Ayuna's question, but I'd love this conversation to continue. And I hope Melanie has something to add to it. But I just want to say, um, Ayuna asked. If gamma drives spiking activities, what's the mechanisms that selectively activates neurons instead of everyone at once? Since, you know, you can see. Um... Right, well, it isn't, isn't gamma like basically flooding the cortex. It's gamma along specific pathways that are being activated but when the when a sensory input comes in. So it's it's not, um, these, these rhythms aren't, aren't a flood all over cortex. They're highly patterned and specific. So think about them the same way you think about spiking. Is Spiking essentially hugs certain pathways in, in the brain, certain networks in the brain, but the gamma oscillations will do the same thing. Thank you. And, I, and now I want to come back to the hierarchy thing that you were mentioning and the role of symbolic anything, whether it's language, math, music, whatever it is that we manage to 
even stack further and <laughs> externalize the stack of like abstract representations. Can I um, answer this in the next five minutes? What's that? <laughs> Can I answer this next five minutes? Well, yeah. uh, in case you can't, I'm going to give the stage to Melanie to, to ask uh, her question. Yeah. I mean, poor, poor uh, Earl, we, we are now at 6.30, right? Yeah. This has been like yeah. the most uh, like rapid answering of so many questions. We we made it through, I think, 50 oh, it's, questions or more. It's been great. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> but at some point, I got to go. That's true. <laughs> Melanie, please go ahead. Maybe the last please, question. Melanie, please. Well, if I can just ask one last quick question. Um, so all of this has been about sort of uh, prefrontal cortex and working memory and so on. But I guess this is related to John's question. There's many animals that don't have a prefrontal cortex. And would we say that they don't have a working memory and or is it somehow implemented yeah, somehow so working in memory a different way? And not just a product of the prefrontal cortex. Working memory is distributed all over cortex. What the prefrontal cortex is good for is, is the control of working memory. So working the working original working memory model by Badley wasn't just how do you hold stuff in mind? It was how you control it too. There was a central executive. So the pre so working memory is all over is our memory are, are all over cortex and involve a lot of cortex, but it's the prefrontal cortex that provides the control of working memory, that executive top-down control. So do animals with no prefrontal cortex have, have no executive control? And if you humans, if you if you um, humans have damage to the prefrontal cortex, what do they become? They be, they become um, they re respond reflexively to the environment without any forethought or thought about the consequences. They just react to things. And that's what animals are more along those lines. With a smaller prefrontal cortex, you're more reactive to the environment and less proactive on the environment. And your behavior is a, what your prefrontal cortex buys you is your buys you the, the flexibility to, for context dependent behavior, where you could respond very differently to the same sensory input in different situations, depending on, on the demands. Animals with less of a prefrontal cortex will have less of that convex behavior and tend to respond to the same thing the same way every time. All right. You should probably let Earl go. This has been really fantastic. fantastic. I'm exhausted <laughs> now. <laughs> well, well, I wish we could all go for dinner, dinner, dinner now. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be great. Excellent. The rest of the night. Right. Sorry, Joe, what? I said go off and be more reflexive for the rest of the day. <laughs> That's right. Time to turn <laughs> cortex. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. That was hugely interesting. Absolutely. I you. wish was... I honestly I wish we had a part two with you so that we could just continue <laughs> like more discussion. Yeah. Well, anytime. Awesome. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Thanks much. everyone. Have a great day.